He's a hard taskmaster. <laughs> <laughs> then he'll tell you what you've got. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Malcolm Rowland, and together with Binod Shah uh, from the United States, uh, we are chairing this particular session. So, not to waste any time and keeping on time, okay, we are going to introduce the next speaker, the first speaker, which will be uh, Amin Rastami. And uh, Amin, he's here? He's right there. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you are indeed here. Okay, you'll be talking about uh, practical strategies in embracing modeling in BABE, revisiting the debate on modalities of modeling and simulation in relation to its adoption. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, yeah, pleasure. So we are starting 10 minutes late, and they've already said that you know, try your best you to see. So your time is cut down by 12 minutes now. Yeah. So I will try to be as fast as you know I, I can. Um, in, in fact, you have got you know all the conclusion you know sort of all in the slide, and that is basically it is not simple. It's not a matter of science. The adoption that we are talking about. So let me just start if this works. You know, which I'm not sure it is at the moment. No, this is not working. Maybe I'll the computer. Yeah, I'll so uh, I think this is basically what we are talking about with regard to the background to this. You heard from Aris how you know sort of I would say terrible you know EMA are in conservative etc etc. But there is another side to it, and the conclusion you know sort of that you get from this paper, which in fact the first author you know you can recognize is Greek. <laughs> Uh, Elefteria has been behind many of these initiatives, you know, with the rest of the OGD team, is what you have seen there as highlighted. And that is, virtual bioequivalence is now accepted. This is more than two years ago. So this case did not include any clinical studies to actually make this particular product coming to the market. Hey. So how this actually works, and then we have gone too far now. Well, I can't, you know, see how I should be operating with these arrows. Okay, we have down arrows. Okay, yeah, okay, now I'm getting. Thanks, Liz. Um, so the way it works is, yes, we, we don't have any clinical studies, you know, but we are using sets of models that uh, they are, okay, I go back, sets of models that they are taking uh, the information. Is it working? Okay. So we are taking sets of data that they are coming from in vitro studies, and this is the important part, we are modeling those in vitro studies. This is a big difference between what we are used to, and that is IVIVC, which you know basically makes a correlation to make the you know the transfer. So the philosophy is completely yes, you need to have the relevant you know studies, for instance, you know, different dissolution apparatus, etc., that you are having should have the right media with no bile salt, this and that. But you are not taking a single value or even a profile like dissolution profile that you can go and fight over whether it is available or whether Higuchi or whether Carl Stenson. That is not relevant anymore. Because what we are doing, we are modeling the data that they are coming from in vitro setup and assigning them to what made that particular observation. So whether it is the shear stress, whether it is the pH whether it is the bile salt concentration, etc., etc. So this is a completely different philosophy. I remember actually Clive in one of the Orbito meetings, you know, saying that we are not shaking the boat enough. And basically after showing, you know, some of this, I said that, you no, know, Clive, actually we are not in that boat anymore. We have switched the boat. We are in another different ship. And the reason for that is that the re we are able by doing this to go and extrapolate to areas that we have never actually looked at, like you know, ethnic differences, for instance, going from adult to pediatric, etc. And when you go to EMA and ask whether they are doing their studies, for instance, in bioavailability, bioequivalence in different subgroups, the answer is no. So in fact, they are leaving all of these assuming that every time that we are looking into those, they are going to be the same. And that's not true. Of course, you need 
instruments, but you need also models that they are setting for that particular, uh, let's say, uh, instrument that you are using. And, and this is one of the things that we discovered early days, that the people who are working in these areas, they are not, let's just accept, they are not good modelers. All the good modelers who can handle a couple of equations, they immediately will go to pharmacometrics group and get you know, very high salaries. So therefore, we came with you know, the idea that we will be providing tools for actually analyzing this data. Whoever wants to know the story of all the models we have created for these in vitro setup, they can read this particular chapter that actually talks about how the in vitro, in vivo extrapolation is informed by analyzing such data. Whether it is permeability, whether it is dissolution, whether it is DDI, it doesn't matter. You analyze that data and put the fundamental information, not a single value, not A to B, B to A, but actually you say what the affinity against certain transporter is, against the abundance of those values and so on. So, as I mentioned, this enables us to extrapolate to situations that we have not catered for. This includes, for instance, you know, the way that you know, the, we do when we are doing the bioavailability studies, etc. There are set standards, you know, I don't know, with 200 milliliter of water, all this. But what happens if that person, instead of 200 milliliter water, actually they have got, you know, half a glass of Coke? Are we going and testing these all the time? No, but we can simulate if we have done it right way. And in fact, another Greek colleague of us, Nicoletta Potaki, has got a publication on that, the effect of Coke. I can't remember what the drug was you know, she was looking at, but we can simulate because the fundamentals are there. The same with regard to the type of food. Okay, we have got better studies. But are we looking at different type of food? Are we looking at the time difference gap between taking of the food and the drug? No. And all of these now can be simulated if we are using those fundamentals. To add even more, yeah, everybody knows our pH after having food is going to go to high in the stomach. But look actually what data we have got on the physiology that suggests the way it goes back to the normal is age dependent. I'm right at the verge. From next year, I will be in the what they call as old group. You know, I'm 59. Next year, 60. So I will be in the other curve. I, I'm sure that it is not, you know, sort of a sudden transition. But nobody has done anything else. Above 60, below 60. So we can put all of those the same with the stomach emptying. Stomach emptying, thanks to you know, the work by many people, including Clyde Werner Watches and you know the. Marciani groups in Nottingham, etc. We know this is a complex situation and we have got the physiology that we can apply depending on the formulation that we are actually putting in. But to add to all of those, when we are doing a bioequivalence, we are not just interested in the median value because the rules are around the confidence interval. And if you want to do a virtual bioequivalence, here comes you know sort of some of the problems now. So ev not everything is rosy. One of them is within subject variability, which could be formulation dependent. So it's not a fixed value. And this publication, you know, for all those who are interested, you know, gives you know the background and chapter and verse. But basically, it is saying what we have been doing for virtual bioequivalence so far. The one that you are seeing in the right hand side of the graph is the one that nobody should do. While ninety percent of people who are publishing, that's what they are doing. This is total nonsense. The reason is that we are assuming that the variability is just assigned after you know, the median thing is calculated and top of the concentration. This is like a sort of a variability for measurement. You know, this is assay variability, nothing to do with the real bit and subject variability of the physiology and its interaction with the formulation. The two in the other side, you know, they are much better. One of them admits that we don't have the bit and subject variability to propagate, the other one says this is the right way we have to do it, but we have to get those values. The problem is that what we recognize as within subject variability and between subject variability, in fact, unless you do mixed effect modeling, they are not separated from each other. If you go and measure everybody only once in this room and come up with a distribution, that's not between subject variability. Because it is possible that all of us, we had on average the same, but each of us had some variability, and we captured that person as part of that variability and so on. So this is what we had to explain in the paper because actually one of our reviewers 
honestly, I was you know, not surprised, but not coming from mixed effect background, they, they couldn't grasp. And, and their comment helped us to add this into our paper and explain a bit more about it. Now, the problem is in the physiology, many of those parameters that I showed you that we can put into the models, they do not come with within subject variability of the parameters. So what we thought about, you know, in that paper that we can do, we said that how about actually using PK in the replicate study of the bioequivalence to see which one of these combination of the variability for physiology propagates and actually comes to what we have seen. The problem with that is that you have got many solutions that can give you, it's an identifiability issue, that give you some of those answers. So what you can do with these kind of things is you can exclude the ones that they are completely unnatural. Now, the remaining ones can only be narrowed down if you apply this for sets of different formulations and different drugs where you have got within subject variability as a result of the, you know, the RTR or RTRT kind of studies that you have done. And this is what we did. But we could not do, this is the bit that you know, goes back to my title of now, you know, the talk, and that is, we could not do any of these if we didn't have the right tool. Because I told you, the number of modelers that they can do and handle their own models and write code, etc., they are not many, particularly in this area. So having the right tool, which is what we call, you know, obviously VBE module that uh, you have heard about SimSip, you know, we have put, made it easy enough that I could give even some of these projects to my MSc students. Even with the PhD is difficult, let alone now we are giving to MSc students. And they are doing a wonderful job. What actually looks, you know, sort of these virtual bioequivalents, these are, you know, simulated virtual bioequivalents, each of those dots of many studies, because, you know, obviously it's on the basis of random assignment of the values, but the conclusion that whether they are within the 80 to 125 percent, etc., they are just usual, you know, bioequivalents that you are all familiar with. Now, when we did that, now we can actually start to look at some of the things that I told you about. For instance, the things that we never do and we believe that they may not be important, but sometimes they prove to be important. I don't know how many people are familiar with this case, Tacrolimus, when we actually, not be, you know, Astellas decided to go from the twice a day to a once a day dose. So they had an extended release. They were clever enough to understand that because of this extended release, they are going to have low, very low metabolism in the lower part of the gut. And therefore, the, the once a day was not two times single dose. In fact, was much less, 1.4, 1.5. But the issue is that that ratio that they would got was only for Caucasians. For Afro-Americans, the difference is much bigger because they have got C3A5, and that difference from the top part to the bottom part is going to change. They could have simulated that because that is already in the population file. But the example I'm going to show you is actually something that's not published. You know, so you are the second group because I have already shown this in Eden and Clive was there as well. Is related to the local bioequivalence versus systemic bioequivalence. So we are talking about a drug that exerts its effect inside the GI in the gut, in, in the gut lumen, in the enterocyte that they are there. So if we want to establish the bioequivalence, of course, according to bioequivalence criteria, it should be at the place that it is active. But the problem is that we can't measure the concentration there unless we basically send the tube, you know, from the nose or from the other side, and then basically look at, you know, sort of what concentration is happening on the R and test, etc., etc. So the true bioequivalence is when the, the formulations are equivalent in the gut lumen, and then when we are looking at plasma, plasma is a surrogate for it. If it is consistent, then it will be either true positive or true negative. When it is inconsistent, it's either going to be false positive or false negative. Of course, if it is false positive, that is the I think the worst case scenario from regulatory part, if it is false negative, it is for the food user of that particular uh, product. So what we have done is for the buddhazonite, because it's locally active, we all know the story of it, and what we have done with the formulation that goes into actually to the right pH, starts opening and then goes to the GI tract, but we know Crohn disease has got a different physiology. So we have to consider that. So before actually doing all of this study, we have to establish 
that's why some drugs they have got higher bioavailability while others they have got lower bioavailability in Crohn disease compared to the normal population and then gather all the physiology and all the biology that's relevant to that so we have done that already so this is the protocol of study we establish you know this is the qualification that Harris was talking about in the first step that we are able to recapture whatever we have seen for at least one case and then the middle part you have got all those virtual formulations with different actually release etc etc you put that into the system work out you know when this is going to be by equivalent locally versus you know the systemic and the result because there are so many of them they have gone into this heat map what you need to get from the heat map is just the colors not all of them green that's the only thing that you need to know and you can see that there is high likelihood that you will actually declare from the plasma something is bioequivalent while locally they are not the green areas the other thing that you can see the pattern okay it's not changing hugely but it's still it is changing with Crohn's disease so at least the good thing is that yeah you can use the healthy volunteers for this it's not massive but you can see both for CMAX and also for the AUC there is a mismatch between the systemic circulation conclusion of bioequivalence versus the local okay this brings me to you know why we have as Aris said in the DDI etc you know we have gone up so much you know everybody knows that even in the academia etc you know that they are using these uh, systems like P P PPK models that they are pre-made with regard to the formulation and the change of the use has been over the last 20 years 40 times as opposed to general area of pharmacokinetics all of these are known but there is a debate that whether we can afford to remain on modeling that involves everybody themselves doing the models I call you know toys for big boys as opposed you know sort of a system that many people without knowing what is under the hood but they know why they are doing it and they are familiar with the input and output can do and we have gone through philosophical journeys on this because not everybody agrees it's still and believe it or not you know most of the modelers are against it because they think that they will lose their job while you know that is not the case by putting all those variabilities that I told you and going back to philosophy on what we started with DDI we can do the absorption as well and that is you know sort of what we have changed so the model rather than drug being focused on drug it is actually focusing on the system and because we are actually focusing on the system we can put them onto one platform that everybody can share and this platform models yes they need to be qualified and this is what Aris talked about and there is a qualification which is different than validation if people are asking you have you validated this for what you are using this is the most I'm sorry to say stupid question that they can ask because if I was going to do this study why did I do the projection so validation for the purpose that you are applying that model is basically cannot be validated until later on post marketing whatever you come up with some you know data but you can show that in other similar cases itself I call it verification qualification it has worked of course you can validate the code saying for instance even Les doesn't like it Michael is mentioned let's say this is Michael is mentioned and it is doing the code whatever Michael is mentioned should be doing you should be able to validate that but not the application for the Buddhist for the local versus you know sort of systemic circulation because if you are going to validate you don't need the model you are going to have the data so this basically brings me to the latest part and you know I'm finishing in two slides or three slides and that is the concept of reusability which FDA OGD now has picked up Leon particularly with regard to master model and we cannot have master model unless we have got a setup that not everybody can go and poke into it and that is the reason that there is a big debate going on versus open source code modeling versus non open source code modeling the prime example would be simsip which is not open source code you can select models it's your choosing but you can't go and change the actually the code itself unless you go to do lua or you know designer and so on 
So it has got the possibility. So these are the definitions. Definitions are common in the software side, but they have never been used in the you know pharmacokinetic area, apart from one paper which you know has never been cited. And when I read you know the you know description, I didn't like it. No wonder that nobody has cited it ever. So we actually rehashed what the software people are using, applied that to series of the drugs, and as Les says all the time, you can't argue with the data. So the data indicates that the reusability is twice as much for the non-open source code models as opposed for the open source code models. In other words, if I don't know, Panos has made a model and Aris, you know, who was part of that team five years later is using, this is not external reusability. He was part of that group. He knew what this model are all about. But if another group starts using that, that basically it is saying it is clear and therefore external reusability goes up. These are published at the moment and the numbers, as I said, you know, they are actually showing it has got many different attributes, but the key thing is external reusability, which is the most crucial thing, particularly when you are going into the regulatory space, actually is higher and in benefit of the non uh, non non open source. So if I go back, and this is my final slide, from a vision to an idea, you just don't need science. You need few other bits and bobs that you are seeing here. And, and those are you know, related to incentives, you know, having you know, this structure in place, having you know, these skills, and so on. And in each of these cases, when these are not available, yeah, you will have you know, sort of different, you know, sometimes you, know, you will have confusion, sometimes you will have you know, sort of the anxiety, frustration, and, and so on. So to get from the idea and vision that we had on the virtual bioequivalence to the end part, it's not just about a couple of papers you know, written and, and submitted and get out there. We need to put all of this in place. And this is what we are trying to do together with our regulatory colleagues as well as those in industry. And end of August, we will have a three-day workshop that is taking us hopefully to another you know, sort of discussion around all of this. With that, I will stop. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Amin. The paper is now open for questions. Any question? Yes, I see a question over there, Carl. Yeah, the EPA is working on, in this area. Comment on that? Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, just repeat the questions. Right. FDA held a conference in, in which you uh, participated a couple of years ago, and it Introduce the idea of the other master model. Uh, can you tell us more about that uh, collaborative effort? Sure. You know, you were of course part of that uh, workshop. It was actually last year. You know, sort of. Uh, um, and the, I would say the white paper, position paper from that one is written by Elefteria, uh, and and uh, hopefully will be submitted uh, by end of May. And that will come out. But uh, uh, the European representative, I'm afraid to say, what Aris said was more or less is there. You know, their sentence is that we haven't got much of an experience, but we are open. So that is basically where they start. While FDA is keen to actually push this forward because of all the advantages it brings. Yes? Yeah. Are, there, are there any other questions? Yes, Panos. You mentioned the increasing properties, but for the lithium capital, etc., do you use absorption rate constant? We never use absorption rate constant as you know a rate, unless you know we are doing a compartmental modeling, you know, and we are putting no. So, no. Uh, another question is, I know you can you apply lightly to what kind of No, for the, you mean working after within subject versus between subject variability? Yeah, yeah, we will be using non mem or, or you know, sort of equivalent, monolix and so on. Okay. Yeah. So, you never try to apply something else or to express the within subject variability when the goes forward? It's not possible. It is possible, but we haven't looked into it. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you've, got, you've got 30 seconds. Right, very quick question. I think the case for multiple uh, measures in the same person. Uh, uh, 
how long between rains would be this? Uh, that's whatever makes sense with regard to taking drugs, you know, sort of because of course, you know, sort of we are not talking about you know sort of a year or two years, because I know that Korean people have done, you know, you are a family there. You know, he was doing it on himself and his son because he said that I can't keep other people for a few years. Yeah. You know, but, but you know, yes, yes, whatever that makes sense. I, I know that uh, uh, Abdul Basik did this paper, didn't he? Correct. He his gastric entry in five grams in five. I didn't mention him because he's not here. You were here, so I referred to you. <laughs> Please be away. Yeah. Thank you very much, Amin. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if we do have time, we come back. Okay. 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 If we have time, I just I'm looking for, you know, because we won't we finish late enough as it is. Okay. So the next speaker, yeah, uh, Pima. Okay. Now we move on to the next topic which will be presented by Dr. Carl Beck. He is the CEO and founder of NDA Partners, LLC, and also the professor, sorry, I have to go back to it, and also the professor at Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences, School of Pharmacy and Medicine, University of California, San Francisco. Actually, I can add one more sentence that I have known Dr. Peck for about half a century, almost half a century, maybe slightly more. So with that, now Dr. Carl Peck is going to be talking about toast, T-O-S-T -O toast, and toast, T-O-S-T -O small toast, versus what is best, B-E-S-T. It's all complications, right? But he's going to simplify everything for us to know that and then at the end he has a question that we have to answer, otherwise we all fail for that. Okay, thank you, Dino. Uh, is toast, toast? If so, what is best? Okay, what I'm going to say in the next 30 minutes, I hope I get 30 minutes, um, represents uh, considerable efforts from a group that uh, we formed about six years ago that we call the Bioequivalence, Bayesian Bioequivalence Working Group. It arose from a, uh, a workshop that FDA sponsored uh, discussing advances in bioequivalence analytics. Uh, and I had been asked to uh, give a talk on Bayesian bioequivalence uh, about which I do nothing. Uh, so I presented a few conjectures. And in the meantime, I discovered an amazing program, a Bayesian estimation program that I thought might apply. So Greg Campbell and I, um, former head of statistics at Center for Devices at FDA, a well-known Bayesian statistician, and I uh, talked with Liang Zhao, the head of the, the uh, research at, in uh, the division of generic drugs at FDA, and, and we formed this group to, to to begin to evaluate whether there were any potential for Bayesian estimation in bioequivalence. So the question I've raised is essentially a play on words. TOAST, T-O-S-T, capitalized, is the analysis that all of you know, the two one-sided t-test that uh, Don Sherman introduced uh, in the 1980s, uh, which has become the standard for evaluating bioequivalence in generic drugs and for many other uh, bioequivalence questions. Uh, toast, of course, has several meetings. I could be giving a toast uh, to Laszlo, which we'll do later on. Uh, I could be eating a piece of toast from a toaster. Um, but in this case, I'm going to use the word uh, toast being American usage to not be in trouble or to completely be defeated. In other words, have we discovered a methodology, a Bayesian methodology for Bayesian, for bioequivalence, that should take TOAST, T-O-S-T, capitalize completely away? That's the question. So, what is best? Well, again, another play on words. Best, in this case, uh, would mean, on the one hand, excelling all others, or better than, but BEST Capitalize is the name of a software program that was introduced into the literature by John Kresge uh, uh, roughly 
decade ago uh, with an interesting article title called Bayesian Estimation Supersedes the T-Test. I'd always been looking for a Bayesian T-Test, and I discovered one. This is an, an amazing article, and I, I, rec I recommend that you uh, read it uh, when you have about a whole weekend to do so. So uh, as, a result, as a result of this um, symposium six years ago, Greg Campbell and I began to wonder about the assumptions associated with TOAST, the two-one-sided t-test. Uh, there, are, there are three very important assumptions. One is the, the log-transformed uh, test reference ratio of AUC and CU max is normally distributed. Uh, secondly, because we use quite small sample sizes in typical bioequivalent studies under 50, sometimes as few as 12 or 24, uh, we wondered whether those small sample sizes could be repeated sufficiently uh, to uh, enable inference under the central limit theorem. Thirdly, because we were aware that many bioequivalent studies uh, have an occasional extreme value in it, how robust is TOAST? and what would be an alternative to evaluating true bioequivalence in, in the face of uh, one or more um, aberrant values. So just a, just a comment about the BEST package uh, that uh, John Cross again introduced. Basically, uh, normal frequent test t-tests, for example, assume the normal distribution or inference. Toast. I'm sorry, BEST, B-E-S-T, assumes the t-distribution. And it's based upon studies um, in many real-world events, uh, real-world situations, in which the data actually doesn't look very normal once you get it. It can look skewed to one side to another, and that's not uncommon in bioequivalence data sets. And it can have some apparent values that you would like to discard, but in the case of bioequivalence studies, FDA will not permit that. So this is a software program written in R that estimates the parameters of the t-distribution when doing hypothesis testing such as the, such as the t-test. It produces a distribution of the parameters of the t-distribution, the highest density interval, which is equivalent to a confidence interval, and the distribution of, of, of the effect side, and some wonderful graphics associated with it allow you to evaluate the assumptions uh, underneath the method. So I just want to make a comment to the modelers in the room. Um, statistics, statistics can seem kind of magic. You take a data set, throw it into a program, and computes a, the t-test and the p-value. But actually, it's very similar to pharmacokinetic modeling in the set, sense that TOAST, for example, is fitting a model, the model being the normal distribution, to a set of data and estimating two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. And in the case of BEST, which uses the uh, T distribution, it's estimating three parameters, the mean, the standard deviation, and a parameter called the shape factor or the, uh, for the, or the, or the, or the degrees of freedom. And here you can see what, what these models look like. They don't look like pharmacokinetic models because of their statistical distribution models. But bear in mind also, we're not talking about the t-test, the, the t-distribution as it's applied to the t-test. We're talking about a distribution that has the properties of the t-model. So the t-distribution looks like this. It looks somewhat normal, and it can be normal depending upon the value of the shape factor, which is v. It has a mean and a, and a standard deviation. To get a sense for what the T distribution is like, there's a wonderful shiny application uh, that you can find on Google that shows uh, what the T distribution looks <coughs> under various values of the shape factor. So if you look on the left, when the shape factor is 30 or higher, it is exactly a normal distribution. But when the T distribution, when, when the shape factor is less than 30, maybe gets down to, uh, I think, five, as I put here, you get to see longer tails, and they can be on either side of the mean. And that can capture, that can model better data, real-world data, that, that has long, longer tails, 
or even uh, aberrant values. Time doesn't permit me to explain the, the prior distributions used in the BEST program. But they're extremely uninformative. In other words, we're not using prior information to adjust. We're using the prior information actually to permit the actual model uh, estimation from crashing because if you only have just a few values in the data set, uh, it, it can appear to be over, over parameterized. So the prior distributions on the mean, on the standard deviation, and on the shaft shape factor are essentially a thousand times greater than a normal model that would be uh, fitted to, to the data. Here are a couple of examples of how this works in the upper panel. You'll see a data set on the right-hand side, a histogram of a data set that looks pretty, pretty uniform, pretty uh, symmetrical, like, like, like a normal distribution. This is actually an NDA data set that was sent to FDA. It had 16 subjects in it. <clears throat> and um, you can see on the left-hand panel, there's a distribution of the estimated means, the posterior estimated means. Uh, and um, it looks pretty normal, doesn't it? The shape factor distribution, and again, these distributions that are generated by the BEST program are quite unique. When you do a t-test, all you get is the t-value and a p-value. You don't get any diagnostics as to whether or not the underlying assumptions have been, have, have, have been met. So in this case, the shape factor is about 26.9, which is close to 30. So it's no surprise that the, the uh, toast and best would, would, would agree in this data set. The lower data set, if you look at the histogram, it's got um, you know, the fairly large group of values that look more or less normal, but there's, there's a couple of aberrant values out to the right. And what that does, if you look at the mean, uh, value, the mean value block on the left-hand side of that lower panel, you'll see that there's a tail, a rightward tail, and the shape factor turns out to be 4.8. So this is, this is quite a non-normal distribution. But the T distribution does a pretty good job of fitting it. The small blue lines in those two panels, C and D, are posterior predictive checks for those who do modeling and marker coconutties. You can see that it's doing a reasonably good job of fitting the data. So, um, we have two parts to our research program on this. One is a massive number of simulations that we've done uh, evaluating uh, data sets that are actually normal, uh, log normal or normal. Uh, and then we have an ongoing set of information that um, uh, a research of a couple thousand ANDA data sets. I'll say a few, a few words about that in, in, a, in a moment. But what I'm going to uh, per, uh, report on now are, are just these, these simulation data. So we've been stimulating, simulating data sets that are actually normal. Uh, we've used the standard uh, 80 and 125, type 1 error of 5%, but then in, in between something variability of 20%, um, we evaluated log normal distributions and normal distributions of the T over R ratio. Um, you'll see that we assume certain means from 0.8 to 0.1 to 1.25 with uh, intervals in between the 0.8 and 1.25 would clearly be non-equivalent. Uh, Non-bioequivalent, you, you can't get a 90% confidence interval if the actual mean is, is, is at those boundaries. But it's not uncommon to see by BE data sets that or hover around 1.0 as a mean, or even as low as 0.9, or, or up to, up, up to, up to 1.1. We evaluated different data set sizes, 10 to 50, uh, and we threw a few extreme values, 5% randomly, into some of these data sets to see what the, what the uh, comparative robustness of toast versus best. So um, here you see a set of panels, some, somewhat complicated, but the far left and the far right assumed a mean value of 0.8 or 1.25. And 
And you can see that the type one error is maintained where, when the vertical axis is power or the equivalent um, pass, passing rates. Um, This slide set shows our simulations of data that were actually log normal. And so you would expect Toast to do very well. And as it turns out, BEST does, a, does about equivalent. In other words, BEST is able to discover the underlying normality uh, with a uh, shape factor value that's estimated at 30 or more. And so um, you can see in the second panel, for example, uh, the, the power, if you had only 10 subjects, is about 12. Uh, to get 80% power, which is what you'd like, you really need uh, 20 to 30 subjects at, at least. Um, for, uh, and even fewer if the actual mean value is, 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 is around one. So this teaches that the best uh, approach would be equivalent to best to toast uh, in the case of uh, log normal data, where the actual mean values of uh, bonus between 0.9 and 1.1. And, uh, but what about the data were actually normal, not log normal? Here you see a, a deviation. Um, you can see the, uh, the best is that the red uh, curve Toast is the blue curve. And uh, the red curve is typically above the blue curve. In other words, Toast is more powerful in identifying uh, bioequivalents when it's actually there if the data are normal rather than, rather than log normal. So what happens when there's uh, extreme values in there? Well, this is where toast really falls apart. And all, all of you know that if you take the mean, uh, just the mean and standard deviation of a data set that, had, that might be normal, but you have a couple of extreme values in it, what happens? The mean gets biased to the, to, in the direction of the extreme. And the variance expands. And so you have a, a fit to the data that doesn't match the data itself, but you forced a normal distribution model on, the, on top of it. The T distribution, however, is a much more robust uh, estimator when there is a extreme value like this. So if you have extreme values, one or more, in your bioequivalence data set, the power using TOAST uh, actually never reaches 80%. Now these extreme values that we put in there were pretty extreme, but it's not uncommon in real world bioequivalent studies if you don't throw it out along the way, which FDA doesn't permit, permit to find extreme values that uh, are troublesome and that cause the data to appear to be non-bioequivalent. -bio so what have we learned so far? Well, I would have to say, we can't say that toast is toast yet. But when there are no extreme values in the uh, log TR values, best and toast are pretty, pretty much equivalent. However, best is much more powerful if the data are not log normal. It requires fewer subjects. And so, in this case, it can disadvantage a, a sponsor who submits data to FDA that doesn't turn out to be log normal, and FDA does a TOAST study uh, evaluation on it and declares it not bioequivalent. So we concluded that, if, that this TOAST, that this uh, best program can be a complementary uh, application that is worth considering. So the group, and this, I'm not speaking, this is FDA speaking, has uh, uh, authorized me to say in this statement, in this uh, presentation, that if applicants, or bioequivalents, generic applicants, or 
it's a, a, a sponsor of a new drug that's done a bioequivalent study. And uh, if you are worried about having extreme values in there, or if you worry, as you should, that the data may not be log normal, that you can talk to FDA in advance and let them know you may be doing this if there is these violations of the basic assumption for toast, they may permit you to use that uh, in, 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 in evaluating. So finally, I just want to say something about the research that's underway. Um, the group has captured over 2,000 real ANDA data sets, and they've applied uh, a, a, a test or normality, the shapiro wolf test, and discovered that at least a quarter of the ANDA data sets uh, are not normally distributed according to the shapiro wilkes test. As well, about a, half, about a quarter of them have extreme values in them. And some of these have been outright rejected because of this non-normality and the, uh, and, 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 and the um, extreme values. Finally, so, so we're analyzing all of those. I'm not authorized to tell you what we're finding yet, about which is better, toast or best. We're also looking at two other methods. We were, uh, it's hard to get this paper published. We had some very tough reviewers, and some of them wanted us to look at a couple of other models, the uh, Bayes model used in normal distribution, and the Bayes model used in the skew T distribution. So it's not time to declare that toast is toast, but um, you may be encouraged by FDA to think about an alternative approach which may save the day in case you have deviations in these basic assumptions. Any questions for Dr. Fett? What does the FDA do when normality is rejected? If you look at the FDA guidance, it discourages even testing for normality. Okay? So, so, no, they say you're not bioequivalent if toast doesn't give you bioequivalence. So, you know, this guidance uh, is pretty rigid. We don't think it's a good idea, and I, I think you'll see in a, in a revision that that's going to be changed. Uh, I have a comment and a question, both of you prefer. Sorry? I have a comment and a question. What do you prefer? I'll leave that to the chairman, Chair. Well, the answer is both, probably. <laughs> OK. The comment is, as a statistician, all statisticians are Bayesians. Regrettably, most of them don't know it. <laughs> That's the comment. That's a good one. <laughs> And and the and the question is actually cost gives us this exactly the same power if we have a ratio and it's reciprocal. So we have, you have you have a graph with 0.9 ratio and 1.11. This curve should be exactly the same. That's mathematics. That's you don't need simulations or whatsoever. This is analytically. They should be exactly the same. Right. Well, you know, when you do simulations, we did a thousand simulations. Now, we did, did just to answer the question, is that thousand enough? We did a few that no. are 20,000. No. And uh, that confirmed. Now, what, what I didn't emphasize is there's two other lines on there. And those are actually a, an alternative method in which the Bayesian uh, and Toast uh, are evaluating their arithmetic ratio, not the log ratio, the arithmetic ratio. And uh, you need to read the paper to sort of get the, uh, the sense, but, but I would love to engage in a correspondence with you for your, for your ideas. OK. Any other questions? Yes, one more. Sure. Can I have an idea? I'm not sorry. I have an idea. I'm not statistician. However, you didn't have a Bayesian approach. 
a priori it should be better than the classical. The a posteriori distribution. I think. I really <laughs> We would probably need to ask the statistician about that. Uh, I mean, um, yeah. basically, uh, the frequentist approach dis discards all prior information and relies on the data alone. Whereas the Bayesian approach can take into account prior distributions of the parameters of the hypothesis of the model. Using a non-informative, you know, permits us a lot more flexibility in actually fitting the model and generating distributions that we can examine. Um, so, uh, as, as our statistician said, all statisticians uh, are Bayesians, but some are restricted by their regulatory agencies to apply models that don't fit. <laughs> I don't think that this is the case, but better it is. Here in Europe, for even this kind of problem, we think that we have a highly variable drive in several cases. And we have deviated and applied the specific modeling of the biochemical weakness according to the CP of the enormous, the classical approach. So we take care of this problem associated with our clients as well. And we, we control it. Right. I think FDA has some uh, some flexibility in that respect as well, uh, but I'm not sure it's always good for patients. Maybe call in the interest of time, you two can discuss. Yes, indeed. I would also bring that decision together and come up with a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. When you put your hand over the put the head over the bridge, you know, the turret, you're asking for trouble. Okay. Yeah. We go on to the next speaker, which is uh, Michael Burgos, and he's uh, from Canada, a long way. And I think it's warmer here than it is in Edmonton. And uh, he's going to be talking about bioequivalence exceptions to the rule. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we see? <coughs> yes. So, uh, just as a, a statement of uh, the process of reconciliation in Canada, I just wanted to acknowledge that the work that is done at the University of Alberta and applied pharmaceutical innovation is done on located on Treaty 6 territory, and we respect the history, uh, languages, and cultures of our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and all the First Nations of Canada, whose presence in continues to enrich our vibrant community in uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Um, also would like to acknowledge that presence of Laszlo in Canada has had a significant impact on uh, pharmaceutical development and from the Canadian pharmaceutical ecosystem. So uh, this is generally what I was thinking about talking about today. I think we'll echo a lot with a lot of the conversations we've had so far. So we'll start with our patient, which I'm calling Fred, but as this is Greece, we can call him Manoli. Um, he's 72 years old, uh, you know, as during COVID, he was having a lot of uh, Big Macs, and he had a, a very large cardiac event. I ended up in the cardiac ICU, and as some of you may know, during COVID, the cardiologists had a lot of free time on their hands, so they gave him a, a, a cabbage open heart surgery. So he ended up in the ICU in Edmonton, and uh, we started him with a uh, post pro-surgical sphazlin, and then he's got his uh, PPI, a little aspirin, um, of course, some statins, uh, a little diltiazam for the sprinkle. 
and uh, then we've got uh, his beta blocker and another anticoagulant, antiplatelet, and of course some hydromorphone for pain. So, you know, at this point, let's talk about Manoli and Fred here and think about the physiological impact that's happening to him. Uh, he's just had a cardiac event, so that's a big physiological event. Then they cracked him open and then they sewed him back together again. And now he's sitting in the ICU. And let's, you know, we, we talk about that and we think about, well, what is happening in his body from a pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic perspective? Uh, when we talk with my colleagues in ICU, they tell you if you monitor their hepatic function or you monitor their, their renal function serially over time, it's going up and down, up and down. They got uh, transient hepatic and renal dysfunction. You've got massive volume changes. Uh, cardiologists and surgeons love to pump lots of saline in there, and then that goes all the way. Um, you've got definitely a lot of inflammation occurring. You crack them open, he's got a heart attack. He's, uh, so the impact of that is, occurs transiently over time. So all that is happening, and we're giving him all his meds at the same time. So, and then we, let's talk about the GI tract. So we know that um, Fred has been given some oral meds. So while all, in the mix of all of that, his oral meds are trying to, his tablets are trying to dissolve, they're trying to enter into a dissolution process so that they can get absorbed and do the job that they're doing. So that's what's trying to happen at the same time. So, but what is the impact of the disease, his condition that he's in right now? on all of this, on GI mobility, on GI fluid excretion. So you got these tablets trying to dissolve, trying to be uh, uh, enter into the body. Well, for one thing, we know GI blood flow is definitely lower. There's not a lot of blood going into that, into that gut. And then GI transit time, well, that's a guessing game. It could be his uh, pain meds could shut everything down, uh, but there could also be other things that are improve, improve, uh, making things move along. So it's quite a, interesting, and when we, when I talk to our, our frontline pharmacists, we have this conversation about, well, you know, what are we thinking about giving him an oral med while this is all happening? Like really, like what do we, are we expecting something to actually the stuff to work? Uh, but you know, a lot of times our physicians, you know, that is a lot of this is protocol driven. So all those meds that Fred's are on, that's all protocol. That comes from the guidelines. They say you have a heart attack, you gotta put them all this stuff. That's and so they start that right off the bat on day one. Um, so well, we know pain has significant impact. This, this is a study using um, with ibuprofen and in just a simple uh, pain model with regards to dental pain. So we know that in, in this patient, pre-surgery, things to seem to be absorbing rather quickly. You go into post-surgical pain uh, and things are just slowing down. Nothing's getting absorbed. Again, we got another one here, patient nice quick absorption for their ibuprofen, you start pain and uh, do that. You know, I always tell my patients that if you anticipate that you're gonna have pain, take it before the pain starts so that it actually can get absorbed. Because if you're in pain, oh, I have a toothache and then you're gonna take the pain meds, well, uh, nothing's gonna happen. So here's another situation. So uh, we know that we got the pH in the gut is now changing. We've got, uh, uh, so in this situation, we have uh, two formulations that are of, uh, of uh, thyroid meds that we know are bioequivalent, right? So we co-administer that with our standard PPI, which we know every single senior citizen is on. And all of a sudden, the, the formulations that were previously bioequivalent are now not bioequivalent. 
So Fred's on a PPI. You know, the minute you walk into the hospital, they drop it. It's, I think it's in the water fountains, but it's, uh, it's everywhere. So pH is definitely changing, and those formulations are no longer bioequivalent. Now here's uh, another uh, situation where with a rat model with midazolam, we see that in a control situation, everything seems to be hunky-dory. Um, you vaguely suppress the product, but all of a sudden the two formulations aren't behaving the same anymore. One is much better at handling the uh, change in the parasympathetic system than the other one. So. This is my, my when we talking, you were talking about food, it was interesting. Uh, food is, of course, uh, you know, a standard thing. A lot of, uh, some of you might talk to your pharmacist and they say, take it with food. The usual conversation after that statement is, what does that mean? So, you know, your uh, standard individual, maybe 40 years old, they taking it food is one thing. Or you've got a senior who's over 65 whose calorie intake is about half what everybody else is because they just don't eat as much. What does taking it with food mean? Is that a cookie? Is that just a cup of coffee, a tea? Uh, you know, with my mother, I say take it with food, and that's like, you know, a cup of tea and then maybe a cookie. Um, but, you know, with my father, it might be a totally different thing about taking it with food. And when do you take it with food? Do you take it before the food, after the food, in the middle of the food? Anyways, so we know that conversations about food and bioequivalency is big. We have changes in the FDA guidelines around taking a look at low end uh, uh, and high fat because everybody's food is different, right? Uh, you know, we've got also cultural differences in our multicultural society, somebody's food is different. Um, and of course, this being Greece, you can pick up, a, a, this one's uh, right from Monsteraki there, great to Sublaki stand. So the, the, as we, especially in highly multicultural societies, we have, you know, basically a situation where um, we have a, the food persuasion, who, what are you eating? And then you've got the other genetic dispositions that are on top of that. So um, we are going to be seeing this variability in both the food intake, the impact of the food, and then also the impact on the bioequivalent product with regards to existing genetic differences. So it's, it's unlikely, though, that it has a considerable clinical impact, but the thing is, it adds to a to the additional uh, milieu of variability that you're seeing in the patients. Uh, so, in reality, though, we don't often, you know, the thing about the other statement about food is why are we recommending our patient to take a medication with food? There's two basic situations. One is tolerability. You're taking food with food because the drug is causing some GI upset. You add the food, it improves that. Or you're actually recommending it take the food because you need the increased absorption to have a clinical impact so that you get that into the therapeutic window. This is an interesting uh, study where the sponsor wanted to, uh, is, was developing a weight loss medication. But unfortunately, you needed it to have a high fat meal in order to get into the to get a therapeutic concentration. So they really wanted to understand what how they could increase the uh, concentrations, but also help the patient with a low fat diet. Olive so, oil. Well, olive oil, yes, yes. Uh, that well, we got close. So this this is a. Uh, they did a diet drink situation and tried to see if how much bio, how much food effect you can trigger with various degrees of, of fat content. In reality, you can actually get a somewhat reasonable food effect uh, with you know with limited or low fat. So it's really you know uh, an interesting concept of that food, and now with the changing idea of what is food. Uh, the, 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 its impact on bioequivalence is key. So let's go back to Fred or Manoli and let's see what's happening. So um, unfortunately, things aren't going too well. 
So uh, Fred has uh, entered all the, all the signs of uh, sepsis, and they have put him into therapeutic uh, um, sedation. But our physician spoke to the pharmacist and said, well, you know, we don't want to stop any of the meds. Uh, the internists and the cardiologists arm wrestled in the hallway. Cardiologists insisted that all the meds need to continue, and this is what happened. So the, the pharmacist talked to the nurse, and they decided to switch the oral stuff to NG tube. Or in the case of the aspirin, they're going to give it rectally. Now, the thing I want to emphasize is that this is not unusual. This is a very common process that occurs in our sedated uh, critical period patients. And what we find is that there is a massive list of what we, of NG tube or alternative dosing recipes occurring in hospitals every day. My favorite, of course, is diltiazem, one of those drugs that physicians just want to use for no apparent reason. Um, and uh, so, we're getting this now. The patient is now unconscious. It's all likelihood the GI tract is not moving at all. Uh, but yet we are putting stuff into the NG tube. A lot of pharmacists spend their time just trying to figure out when these. Just because you have to give clear, you have to give time between every time you're putting an NG tube dosing. And they sometimes what we're seeing is interaction of the drugs within the NG tube. That's why the ASA rectal was a was a good idea. So this is the question that I get probably uh, every four to six months. So the formulary guys have found a cheaper version of diltiazem and they switched from one provider to the next. It goes in, gets distributed, the pharmacists figure out, oh, this is not the same diltiazem we had before. Before we knew we could open it up, crush it, or whatever. This one, we don't we don't have the information anymore. So we'll how? So Michael, is this bioequivalent to the other diltiazem formulation if we crush it and put it into the NG tube? Um, and of course, the you know, <laughs> what can I say? I can't say, well, you know, neither of them were getting absorbed anyways, so don't worry about it. But, uh, you know, you have to answer the question somehow. Um, so, in reality, I did a little investigation. We, in, in, in Alberta, we have electronic health records. So I went in and looked for the entire province, looked at alternative administration routes. So these are things where we're using things you know, maybe for not uh, one formulation for a different route of administration. So oral NG tube, we talked about that today. Uh, oral sublingual, very common because you know people, the drug companies charge so much for sublingual, and really, is it any different than oral? So let's do it that way. Anal, vaginal, uh, IV fluid is very good for everything. We could aerosolize it. We could use drink it instead of take it intravenously. We could put it in the nose. We could create topical wash. You, you know, we can get it in different ways. Five to ten percent of the doses uh, are being used in an alternative manner. If we look at critical care, it's probably closer to 30, 40 percent of the time we're using one formulation in a different way or another. So really, you know, in conclusion, we've got. The average Fred, our patient, has got physiological changes happening. Uh, he's got situations where we're using formulation for methods that we have never would have used before or never been tested. Uh, the reason why we're doing it, it could be, you know, all of a sudden we don't have an IV formulation for something, so then we're just going to give it uh, orally through NG2 because we don't have uh, a viable IV beta blocker, let's say. Uh, so, it's, it's interesting, but there's really no information out there about how to, uh, to answer these questions about what's happening and how these formulations are going to uh, behave in these alternative environments. We really want to, you know, um, examine in silico and vivo solutions where at least, you know, my thought is that we don't really need to demonstrate 
to do the bioequivalency study and these ideal. But we need to give the frontline staff an idea of what's actually happening to this formulation when the pH goes up and the GI tract shuts down, um, you know, and in some manner, in some way, within the product monograph or some place where they can get this information in a viable place. So inclusion of in silico, it's really a, almost like a sensitivity analysis within the bioequivalency study. Well, what happens if the pH goes? What, what happens if the GI tract is stuck going? Uh, volume distribution is double. What happens to everything? Uh, the alternative dosing, a really interesting, if someone wants to spend an entire PhD, an entire academic life looking at alternative dosing, there is no end to the combinations that we see. Uh, and just because something is sustained release or modified release or releasing, you know, every at 4 a.m. or something like the, some of the diltiazem stuff, doesn't, it doesn't matter. They're going to crush it. They're going to open it up. They're going to play around with it and do whatever just to address their needs. So that's all I've got. Some acknowledgments for, for the help of the study. medications at all. That's also a, a good idea. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned in silico, uh, uh, what came to my mind was uh, artificial some um, baseline uh, PK, uh, baseline simulations in the ideal situation as your and then play around with it to give the extreme situations so if you've got here's my um, uh, ideal way that the PK should look like in your ideal patients okay and then let's hack that and say you know they've got half the GI mobility Occurring. They've got higher pH. Uh, the formulation has is is falling apart. What happens? Like if you've got so you know basically just hack it, crack it, and see what happens. Uh, and at least you can give some guidance to the to the to the to the front line who is breaking it up and playing around with the formulations that they have got in front of them. So I always think about causal Bayesian. Models rather than deterministic models. Okay, yeah. And uh, this guy can tell you what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is a huge problem. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, thank you very much, Michael. I'm not sure how many people actually know that we have got exactly the same situation with bariatric surgery. Yes, uh, yes. Which is a big, big, uh, obviously, well, not issue because of the people who are it, but it's a bigger issue because yeah. of the number of people. The absorption yeah. windows are totally so open. And yes. it is completely unknown that what happens, you know, the different formulation and how they should be taking and what, and we have done some, you know, sort of simulation as you know in those areas. And uh, for those people who are on the regulatory side, I'm not, you know, putting Paris on, on the point because, you know, he's not, you know, sort of going to defend, you know, the EMA people. But some of the arguments that they are putting that we want everything to be done in patients and we know that's going to leave a gap and yeah. then everybody will do what I call in cerebral modeling. Yeah. Depending on their software and hardware in their brain, they will do whatever that they think it is right. And, and this is actually endangering patients. Not having a model that basically gathers all what we know about that situation. Yeah. So they are just passing and transferring the problem. They are saying, it's not my problem, it's not safe, it is somebody else's problem. So in the hospital, they leave you or whoever to give it and say, I didn't put in the regulator what they should be, and then they are just passing the blame to you. 
So I think this is not acceptable. Yeah, with bariatric, we have uh, significant changes in absorption windows. You got, they've got, of course, a lot of them get developed deficiencies of all types of vitamins and iron and all types. But you also, uh, I think a lot of pharmacists who deal with that population try to avoid any sustained release or because they know it's not going to work, the, the smart ones anyways. Uh, <laughs> It goes up and then it's down. Yes, so there's, it yeah, it can go either way. It can go either way. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we come to the last speaker, Dr. Markham Rowland. He does not need any introduction because everyone has seen him for the last two hours. But uh, yes, I have known Markham also for almost half a century, I would say. And uh, he's going to be giving a very interesting talk on microdosing, what we have learned so far. So far we have been dosing all by big tablets, 100 milligram, 200 milligram, 500 milligram. Well, he's going to be changing it now, coming to the microdosing, and let's see what he has to say. Thank you very much, Peanut. <clears throat> uh, before, you know, when I was getting this talk ready, I decided to look up what microdosing means to different communities. And I found out that there, there's a big community, and there's books on it, on microdosing yeah, in the psychedelic area. <laughs> now, what they mean by a microdose okay, is a dose which is going to produce some effects, but not the, the hallucinogenic effects of the drug. So they want to be below the hallucinogenic dose, but they don't want the... We're not going to be talking about microdosing in that concept. All right. So what, what do I mean by microdosing? Okay. Well, a microdose is meant to be a small subpharmacologic dose to a clean subject. In other words, somebody who's never previously been exposed to the chemical. Okay. Quite very little preclinical uh, testing prior to administration to humans, and sometimes it's called phase zero when we're administering in that context. Okay, I wouldn't distinguish that from a tracer because that's an opposite of the confusion. A tracer is a small amount of isotopically labeled drug which is actually intended to trace but not perturb the fate of the existing pool of the compound in the body, in our case, in the body. Okay. Now the mass of a microdose and the mass of a tracer may be very may be the same, but obviously the intention of these two administrations are very different. So one is intended to give very small doses to an individual, which is not produce, not expected to produce a pharmacologic effect, but it's going to give us some PK data. Okay. So the, the idea behind this, and it came from the sense that the, uh, the, what we've noticed is that allometry, preclinical methods for predicting human PK are either allometric methods or IV, IVE methods. And at the time of this uh, studies that we've been uh, thought of, it was about 2000, so it's 20 years ago and things like that. So the, the idea is that the, the, uh, the, where this fails, where these other approaches may fail or be problematic, okay, then a microdose uh, is meant to be the best model for man is man themselves. Okay, I use human rather than man. In the beginning we put man, but now we say human. Okay, so my, and the assumption is that a microdose scales linearly to predict the therapeutic dose PK. Okay. It's, a, it's a, it thought at the time as an empirical approach, all right, you're just going to scale it up, okay. We'll see later on that it's not quite empirical, okay. And we consider it when, as I said, when they, we were worried about the, the, the predictability of the other two common preclinical approaches, okay. So it sits just before a phase one study, okay. The dose that has been agreed upon by regulators is uh, 100 uh, micrograms per 70 kilogram individual, or 100 of the no uh, observable uh, adverse effect level in an animal, like in a rat, and scaled probably for the, for the body weight. Okay. It evaluates, because the dose is so small, 
it evaluates the drug really essentially in solution. There are very few drugs that remain so sparingly soluble that they won't dissolve in, say, 200 milliliters of water. So this one is there. So they're not talking about bioequivalence. They're not talking about solid material properties of, of formulations. Okay. But in order to do this, and it, what became available to allow it to do it, was actually ultra-sensitive techniques. So the one that has been historically been used a long time is the AMS, the Accelerated Mass Spectrometry. You may know it better in terms of, 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 um, of carbon dating, for example, or the age of rocks, or whatever it is. You know. So these are working on methods that are ultra-sensitive. Individual atoms are counted in that method. So you're down to eight of moles, uh, or zeta moles. Okay. And the one, the other one that's come up in more recent years is LCMSMS. And we'll talk about a little bit about that. Sorry, I'll move this back. Sorry, I want to move that back if I can. No, no, no. This is crazy. Where do I move this back? So, so the general design was to give the drug both both radio labeled, both because of AMS, uh, both radio labeled or on an IV to subjects, right? So that was to get the absolute bioavailability and as well as compare it to the oral therapeutic dose of the drug. And we define accuracy as something within a factor of two of the observed therapeutic dose oral profile. So let's see if I can do this one. Okay. So here's midazolam. This is one drug where they have, we have gut wall metabolism. It's a substrate for 3A4 and, uh, and also metabolized by the liver. And these are, all these graphs are dose normalized. So these are normalizing per dose. And if the system is linear, then they would be superimposable. And you can see this is superimposable curve. So that was an interesting observation. Uh, this is fexofenadine. Now this drug is not metabolized at all, subject to, to, to transporters, and, uh, and appears in the urine, uh, in the bile, and, the, and in the feces. And uh, what you can see is the two, goes, uh, two the two curves, the, the oral microdose curve, which is the one in black, and the one which is the mode, which is at the 125 milligrams, which are differing by over a thousand fold now, are also looking mapping very, very similar to the two. And when we compare the IV curve but given alone, and the IV dose of the drug, a given radio labeled drug, in the presence of the oral 125 milligram oral dose, those two IV curves are superimposable. And we determine for the first time, actually, effects of any of by availability. Okay. Uh, another one that was done uh, was uh, this was uh, oral simitriptan, uh, which is a drug which is a not a SIP enzyme. So this is a monoamine oxidase A substrate. And what we see here, once again, beautifully dated, predicted the PK of the compound following the dose normalized IV and oral curve. So they, they were super impressive. Uh, when we got into the highest dose stills, which is 200 milligrams of chlorithromycin, what we saw is that it didn't quite predict. It was out of the factor of twofold. So it's under, so it predicted approximately a twofold under prediction dose. The IV dose was very similar to the therapeutic dose. We didn't show you that, but that's very similar. Okay, but the analysis indicated that where the nonlinearity was was in the gut wall because we could do the drug, metabolite, oral, and IV. And so that system allows you to actually compute where the actual drug is being lost there. And the answer is it's in the gut wall. So the summary of the thing which is done recently, it's about 2019, was that uh, published data. There are 46 low molecular weight compounds which have been compared micro and oral therapeutic. 68 or close to 70% of those 
are predicting the oral PKA at therapeutic dose, including the shape of the curve. And I want to contrast that with anometry, which does, which is okay, 42% AUC, but only 20% of the cases predict the shape correctly. <clears throat> and the prediction tend to be poorer with small volume of distribution to drugs at therapeutic doses. When you give an IV, not unexpected actually, 94% of the IV dose, plus 15 out of 16 compounds, predicted the disposition kinetics of the drug. So this is obviously very helpful in PPPK model development and in oral bioavailability assessment. Now there may be more unpublished data in companies that have used this approach. Okay? But some companies were doubtful about that and challenging and concerned about it. Uh, actually did the test in animals before they did the test in humans. Okay. okay. So let me give you an example of one company that published it was interested in developing anti-malarial material, material, uh, drugs. Uh, and it was aiming for single dose treatment in these things. Uh, they had insufficient uh, confidence in the monitor. And the real problem is in IV, IVE. Okay. And the anomaly just gives you some idea of the clearance of this drug. It's between 0.6 and 8. Trick to the mic. Pardon? Trick to the mic. Yeah, I do apologize. Thank you, Mayor. OK. So they, they had confidence in the test compounds because they've been developing them. So they were fairly confident they could predict that the PK would be linear. OK. And the findings was when they give it to, to uh, subjects uh, that this drug, uh, the half-life was too short, even less than competitors, the calculated availability was all moderate, and they decided to stop the program. So instead of doing a whole lot of study safety studies, they didn't need to do that. And they, did, they, they, they stopped, which is one of the aims of this uh, thing, to challenge the uh, subjects early. Uh, this is another interesting example where a compound, where the company had the luxury of having four compounds which they could be moved up to phase one. Okay, and what they did was they gave IV uh, microdose, okay, microdose doses, uh, oral and IV for all the four compounds. Okay, so there, and what they did was they had they had those drugs and they gave them to different individuals, and they got that. They used a PPPK model once they got the data, because I said to you, you can use a PPPK model to give them the IV data to get the disposition condensed of the drug. And what they did was they selected, based upon the various criteria they employed, the compound A turned out to be the best for them. It had sufficient exposure at the end of a dosing interval, which they deemed as 12 hours. Okay, And when they actually did it in the subjects and so on things, it predicted precisely the same PK as what they got with the microdose. So that was very promising for them. Actually, the, the, the program bombed. It didn't work out because it didn't have efficacy. The, 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 the PK approach worked very well. Uh, this is another example uh, of the drug. Now, this drug was an H1 antagonist. And it was intended to be a selective drug for the treatment of insomnia. So the right PK, the shape is everything in this one of these. So they know dihydrohydramine is a sedative, okay, and an H1 sedative inhibitor. And so they knew from the, the, from the, uh, the microdose data and the uh, therapeutic dose data that that scaled linearly. So then they evaluated a number of different compounds uh, in or virtually almost like a cocktail approach. So these are the backup molecules that they're thinking of selecting. And what it is, is they found out that the one that they selected then had the lowest clearance of the drug. So this one, the, the compound they started with was 44 liters per hour, and it dropped down to 8.8 .8 liters an hour. And so they, they selected that drug to move forward on the, on the program. So that gives you some idea that people are using it uh, to help make decisions. The other thing that I mentioned about in the previous one with the H1 antagonist is that you can use the idea of a cocktail. Now, the regulator will permit you to give 100 micrograms as one dose. 
But there's nothing stopping you if you've got the sen sensitivity that you can give 20 milligrams, five compounds, 20 milligrams as a cocktail. And they don't interfere with their PK, and so therefore you're looking at them as a kinetics of the drug. And that idea has been touted. So when will microdose be problematic? Because you want to know when it's not going to work. Because there's no point in doing it if you thought that it's going to, not going to work. So the answer is obviously when you saturate one or more of the processes responsible for the PK of the compound. So this is mostly seen with large oral doses. And Vinod mentioned about 100, 100 milligrams and greater, that sort of drug. It's not uncommon, although in fact of Enidine, we were uh, 125 milligrams, we were getting the near PK, which is interesting. So what is the approach that people have determined? Well, there's several approaches. Uh, the group in Japan, Shukuyama's group in Japan, did a whole lot of studies and had some, uh, some formulations that related to the dose over the peak of the uh, KM of the enzyme or transporter as being indicative of the one when you, get, when you get saturation. This is another proposal where they just simplified the systems of the GI crack, the enterocyte, the liver, and the plasma uh, into simple formulas. And then you looked at with the, with the, PK, with the KM of the compound, and the uh, uh, there, whether you're going to get uh, uh, higher than you would have expected to, to demonstrate nonlinearity in that so saturation. So you see, for example, Manazolan, that if you gave, I can't really look at that. I think it's 100 milligrams uh, of the drug, then you would saturate in the gut, uh, but you wouldn't saturate in the in the gut wall or in the uh, uh, um, liver or in the, in the GI uh, or in the uh, kidney and the plasma. Uh, whereas if you look at uh, uh, fexofenadine, you see it, you would see it in the, in the higher dose for the maybe even solubility may be a criteria there. But once again, it got under and therefore this one that it turned out to be was you could get saturation. But they did that and looked at a lot of compounds and many compounds in the therapeutic dose range was, uh, was a linear PK, they predicted. So you would use that. The ones that are out of it, the line, is the ones which are, uh, I don't know if I can do this. Uh, no, I give up. Okay. So the, the ones that are above the lines are the ones of the, oh, all right, okay. I don't know where that is. No, give up. Okay. So they, they actually showed that in things that if the, the, the linear PKA, for the IV dosing, for the oral dosing, and you do find some ones which are nonlinear, so you wouldn't really use this approach for those type of compounds predictions, but you would use it. And obviously, you, what you could use, of course, is a PBPK model to give you some clue as to whether or not that's going to be linear or not, or non-linear, and saturation of the things. OK, so now in the case of monoclonal antibodies, everybody knows that they're non-linear in the low dose. Because what happens is that the, uh, the monoclonal antibody is interacting with the, the target, the antigenic target, uh, and, uh, and, and, and consuming it and eliminating it in a saturable manner. The capacity of the, the affinity for the monoclonal antibody is very high, uh, but the capacity of the, monoc of the, uh, uh, of the um, antigen is very low. So you can readily saturate that system. So that's called target-mediated drug disposition. And you would never think of using this approach to predict the PKA at therapeutic doses, because the therapeutic doses are clearly very different of the drug. So there has been a suggestion in the literature that in fact we should not use this for protein drugs. Okay. I just want to show you an example where the, the individuals developing now a, um, a recombinant coagulation factor 
in there. And um, uh, what they did was they then give a, a, a labelled dose of the drug or the of the drug with different amounts of protein. So this is now what we see is this curves. So these are the actual C14 microdose curves in the presence of increasing amounts of protein. And once again, you can see absolutely linearity. Now, why is that? Now, the reason, unlike the fact of the monoclonal antibodies where you're consuming the antigen, here we're talking about the eliminating capacity. And the eliminating capacity of many of the protein processing processes are, have a high capacity in dealing with a lot of protein. So, in this particular case, they use that thing for selecting their backup compounds for their recombinant protein program. So, we can see some applications. Well, this is the one that we got stuck on. <laughs> uh, this is a, a therapeutic dose, 5 milligrams, okay? And this is a, a therapeutic dose with a tracer dose with it as well. And here's the microdose. And you can see it's radically different than the other one. Now, why is that? Well, that's an example of the one of the monoclonal antibody that I showed you. And that is the situation where at higher therapeutic dose, you're saturating the capacity limitations of the, of the receptor target site of this uh, drug, warfarin, which is oral anticoagulant. So when we gave a microdose, we were below the, the capacity of that system okay, to handle it. So it handled it very well. What we found out was when we did the area under the curve and calculated dose over AUC, we got the same value as clearance as we got for the therapeutic dose. What was different than this one was the volume distribution was radically different. And it was much larger. And the reason is that this target exists in the tissues and it was just mopping up all of the warfarin in the microdose. So therefore, and therefore the half-life got very long. And the only reason we picked this up in the end was the fact that when we came to the next treatment we were going to do, we found there was still drug available, still from the microdose. So we knew there was something amiss. So that one is. Well, recently there's been some work done on the modeling of that. So this is the model of the, of the, uh, of the, of the liver. This, uh, this uh, target sits in the liver, primarily sits in the liver of, of the drug. And, uh, and th these uh, particular authors, uh, which is uh, Chukiyama's group again, uh, divided up the, the liver into five co compartments, used that one is, and attached the, uh, the one-fifth of the receptor dose, uh, target dose, into each one of those ones, is, and then modeled that. So what they were modeling was the, the microdose and the therapeutic dose data to give them insights into the target occupancy with time. And so th therefore what we're doing and trying to do now is to actually relate that to the clinical parameters that people often use like prothrombing time and, and the like. So that's quite a powerful technique. Now in the case of warfarin, we don't see any, the, the drug binds extensively to albumin. So it's 99.5% bound in plasma to albumin. Now, whatever there's there is, whatever is binding the, the warfarin in the tissues is binding it with an even greater affinity than the whole of the albumin. You have something like, uh, oh, what do you have now? About 120, uh, 120 grams in the body. Okay, of albumin, and you've got uh, milligram quantities of, uh, of the target, and yet it competes for that, for that and, and keeps it away from the albumin. So that's how strong the affinity is for that one is. But the capacity is very limited. I mean, there's only the equivalent of about uh, uh, a few milligrams of, of, of this component, you know, on a molecular equivalent basis to warfarin. So it's, it's amazing what you can do. Well, what this doesn't show you is what you see with many other drugs. And Amin would be very familiar with this next slide, so, which is what I want to illustrate is shedding. Shedding of proteins is very, very common. Okay? 
And we use that for our liquid biopsies these days. Now the reason we do that is because proteomics has come along and allowed us to characterize very, very sensitively the components which are spilling out of tumors, etc., or very tissues. But it's not just tumors, but it's actually just targets coming off, coming off, sh shedding from the, from the, from there. So well, we should recognize that that's thing. So what we mean is that if, they, if they're shedding into the plasma, then it actually binds to the plasma, and we have target mediated disposition viewed from the plasma. Now, what sort of compounds do we see that with? Well, we see it with the, with the ACE inhibitors. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see that with the ACE inhibitors. Now, ACE, ACE is the uh, adrenal, uh, is a, uh, adrenal, uh, uh, ah, my mind slips. Okay, it's ACE, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, ACE, that one is. Well, what you see with different ACE inhibitors, you have different profiles. So in the case of the ACE inhibitor perantoviral gland, okay, that has uh, in the order of uh, when you saturate there, you get a you get a fraction unbound of about 0.8. So there's very little in the plasma that's binding to anything. Whereas when you look at uh, this one, perantoviral, okay, then what we found is is you can see that you can see the um, the target the target binding in the plasma. Uh, but the, at the point of view saturated it is only 0.2. So this has a high affinity. So if the affinity for the for a non-specific protein like albumin is much greater than the amount of, of the target which is being shed, you won't see it in the plasma protein binding beta. You'll only see it if you actually then get in towards the target level and there's enough of the target available to bind. So we just need to be intelligent about what we do here. My last part of my talk uh, is uh, no more new developments. Uh, the idea here is intra-target microdosing. So the idea is, is this, uh, if, you can, if you can still allow 100 micrograms to be administered, but you administer it to the body, body weight profile of 100th of the body weight of a subject, okay, then you're in the equivalent basis of exposing them to therapeutic doses of the, of the therapeutic concentrations of the drug. So this is the general idea of that one is. So this one is, and so there's two approaches that have been done. One is using intra-arterial, so you infuse it into the artery of a vessel that you target, where you think the target tissue is. Or you can, in the case of, uh, of, of uh, tumors, oncology, you inject it into the tumor. So we put it directly into the tumor. And we try to monitor what the outcome's going to be. So I want to just give you two examples of that. So one example is um, modeling the intradose administration of insulin and looking at glucose outcome. Now we can look at the effect of glucose uptake, okay, by using 5-fluorodeoxyglucose uh, uh, uptake curves. And we can see that in these curves. So if you look at the uptake curves for the intra-arterial administration versus the full systemic dose of the insulin, okay, then this is a microdose of the insulin against the full therapeutic dose of the insulin. And you can see the response curves for uptakes into the tissues of the glucose is the same. So that tells you that it's a, it's just a therapeutically effective concentration. Okay? Whereas when I look at the systemic microdose, therefore, then it's much, much less, and the placebo is even going negatively. So the point of that is this is demonstrating the principle of that. Obviously, you need a relatively sensitive tissue, and you need one that's going to, re you're going to have to have a response, which uh, responds pretty quickly so that you can see it in the, in the time that you're administering the, the anti-arterial. And you can infuse it over a, a half an hour, an hour. I mean, you can produce that at a reasonable concentration to the drug. So that's a, a nice example which just illustrates the principle. Uh, what we've signed now, which has become commercialized, 
is my is target interstitial microdosing. Okay, so now you can administer multiple drugs into a tumor. Okay, now this is a surface tumor, so this is this principle. Multiple drugs administered there, so they they actually infuse eight drugs into a tumor. Now you could, they if they have talked about them injecting twenty drugs. So they're looking at which ones do they get the best response from. So what we see here is that in the lower, in the lower, uh, the left-hand panel, on the top insert on the left-hand panel, the actual they they injected a dye with it. So you can see where the, the where the drug is being administered in these little little micro needles. Uh, and below, what you see in the figure on the left-hand side is the spots of the of the compounds which are administered in different sites. So, what this uh, this was a, a, a procedure done before the surgery when they're taking out the tumor. So this was done. So they were looking at what was the effect on the histological effects of the drug. And at the same time, they were doing the, the concentration time profile uh, against well distance profile. Uh, and looking at the, the different compounds that they were administering. And uh, that one is, uh, what you see here is they're very different. I think one of the drugs in here uh, was for, uh, no response at all for the tumor, whereas uh, one of the other ones responded quite well, and one of the ones in blue responded very well. So the biomarker data shows you that there is a different, very big difference in sensitivity to this particular drug. In this particular of this particular tumor to the different drugs, so this is now used as a screening procedure very early on, just to find out which compounds are worth pursuing in, in oncology. So why spend a lot of money on a on a tumor when you know, it's not going to respond to your chemical? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. So there's a number of companies which have adopted this technique. So what I've hoped to have uh, shown you was that. Uh, there is a place for microdosing in drug discovery and development. Now, I don't want you to think about psychedelic drugs anymore, but uh, think about you know drug development. But, uh, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. You're going to say some nice words, are you, George? With the advent of fluorine 18, which you you gave a very good example with yeah. fluorine 18 uh, deoxyglucose, a lot of studies have been done. We have done a lot of work on receptor binding pharmacokinetics with the advent of carbon 11 and fluorine 18 level drugs. Yes. Alprazolam, for example. So if you have five derivatives of a series of important compounds and you have one label with carbon 11, you can then study the which one of those five compounds exhibits in humans, in individuals, the best clinical receptor binding pharmacokinetics how you can displace them. You spoke of correctly, you, you brought examples of in uh, compounds that are inhibitors of certain enzymes, like difluoromethyl ornithine. Fluorine 18 is now used clinically to label proteins and do People are doing receptor binding pharmacokinetics. I'm mentioning this because this audience here, being so strong in pharmacokinetics, ought to be looking at microdosing. If you have one derivative labeled with carbon 11 or fluorine 18, you can do human studies with microdosing Correct. with different new compounds. Yeah. No, I think I absolutely wanted, George. I just wanted to compliment what you Thank said. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, once a method becomes available, and as I said at the beginning, it was thought originally, you know, as a, an empirical approach. 
because you just multiply it to scale up linearly. But actually, we, we, we know more about microdosing, we know more about protesting with PBPK and with the IVIVC, uh, IVIVE. And so we'll be able to better predict which ones are we likely to be microdosing that's going to be informative versus those ones which are not. So, Malcolm, the take-home message is for the very insoluble compounds like anti-cancers and early development, this is the way to find about absolute availability. Uh, I think yeah, it's yeah. a take-home message. Is so? Yeah, you can you can use it, but you know some people have been using it as a tra as a tracer, you know, an IV tracer, which is different than a microdosing because this person's never had the drug before, so it's really a very different phenomenon we're looking at. But what was interesting is that the IV curves were superimposable to the, of the microdosing, were superimposable with the IV curve that we saw with the therapeutic dose orally. Any other? Yes, Clive. There are examples of the way you use a microdose tracer and then follow it up with a different tracer. Yeah, I mean, I'm very careful in the language I use. So when I talk about microdose, I really mean a sub-pharmacologic dose, not intended to produce any effects whatsoever, and and uh, and it's given to a naive uh, subject, so they have never received the drug before, because that one is the minute we give higher doses. We're in a different environment entirely. Regulators now fully accept that we could give a, micro, a microdose, and that's uh, uh, pretty safe to give. And so, well, of course, in traces, we are giving microdoses. Yeah, yeah, but we're giving tra yeah, the traces. Yes, absolutely, it's different. But James, I yeah, and it is a bird. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay, I think we should start. I know we we're running about five minutes early, but we, we need the time later for the next session. Uh, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sebastian Polk, who is from the university in um, Krakow. I sometimes have trouble in pronouncing the name of your university. Jagiellonian University. Yes, 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 yes. And, uh, uh, there. And also, it was works with within Satara. So he's going to be talking about um, PKPB, virtual uh, based virtual drug equivalence assessments from bioequivalence to therapeutic mm -hmm. to pharmacokinetic interchangeability. That sounds very good. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Marco. It's a great pleasure to be here. I always take the opportunity and spend a couple of seconds. Talking about my university, it's one of the oldest in Europe. It was established in the 14th century, 1364. Uh, it's quite a good school, actually. Um, and the second thought, well, what these meetings are for? To keep people thinking and to, you know, kick minds to, to, to think about things. 
so after Clive Wilson's presentation, I started thinking about virtualization and where we are with the virtualization in general. We're in the middle of it. We, we, we can't, you know, escape from it. The only thing which we're not virtualizing is the process of eating so far. <laughs> eating is important. We, we've got virtual sex even. Look at that. Everything virtual right now, apart from eating, which is, you know, proof that it is an e important part of our life. So there's no escape from that. And regardless of how we do that, it is tossed or best we do that virtually or um, uh, in some other way, we, we're going to do that. And PPK is in the middle of that when it comes to drugs. We're right just there. Uh, we've been using PPK models to run virtual clinical trials. And uh, SimSip is in the middle of that as well. So uh, we've got a bunch of drugs and examples where SimSip was used. Um, to mimic a clinical trial and to waive clinical trials. So we are virtualization in, in, in fact. So we are there. It's been established and so there's no discussion about that. I mean, details are important and that's why we are here and we're discussing de uh, details. But the question is, where is the future and what you can expect in, in the future? And that's the second thought which I had. Uh, it's so good to be among scientists, even if they're statisticians. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, and um, the, the thought is, I haven't heard the, the word chat GPT for the last 10 hours. It's absolutely beautiful and fantastic. I like this feeling, really. So uh, what is the future um, of virtualization in, in, in general? So we are here uh, by equivalence, therapeutic equivalence. That's something where uh, we prove that models and modeling and simulation can work and work really. So I think the future is one step farther, uh, pharmacodynamics and virtualization of the clinical outcomes, QSP, quantitative systems pharmacology. That's, that's the next step, and I think we're going to get there sooner or later. Um, so uh, the next question which we'll be asking and uh, time which we'll be spending as scientists is pharmacotherapeutic interchange and uh, personalized medicine and how to use models and virtualization to help uh, single patients like those mentioned by Dr. Uh, uh, Girgis with multiple drugs uh, taken at the same time, with multiple uh, conditions taken at the same time. The same when it comes to pharmacotherapeutic interchange and, for example, using different drugs. What if the doctors don't have diltiazem handy? So can they use something else and how to prove that something else will work? That's something I think we'll be working on. And I'll try to show one example how it can be done, hopefully. We'll see whether it will work or not. So, um, what do we need to do all of that? Simple stuff, all we need is data, models, uh, people capable of uh, doing it, uh, understanding of the income uh, of the uh, input data, understanding of the output data, uh, proper analysis. So it's not such a big deal. Just to give you one example of uh, not so obvious virtual bioequivalence, which has been done recently and published recently uh, by uh, our colleagues. Um, so what they did, they used virtual bioequivalence um, as a concept to test whether two different formulations, oral suspension and orally taken tablets, are bioequivalent. So again, when it comes to the therapeutic equivalence, we've got the same uh, formulation, it's not a big deal, but here uh, there are some complexities which needs to be considered, and it proves that it can be done once the model is there, one, once the understanding is there. So what they did, they uh, followed the general concept of our approach. First of all, they build the model, they verify the model, then they uh, run the in vitro studies, they understood the data which they had from the in vitro uh, the solution study, something what Amin mentioned previously, it's not only about running the in vitro uh, uh, experiment, it's about understanding the in vitro experiment and the output and model the output properly. And then they tested the virtual, the, the bioequivalence in a virtual way, and uh, tested the uh, safe space or defined the safe space for the critical quality attributes for these uh, drugs. So why not go a step farther? Why not to test and compare with each other tablets versus uh, uh, rectal suppositories? We will be exchanging them. Our people are doing it already. It's just a next logical step, which will happen very soon. But the next question will be, what if the drug is uh, developed ad hoc? Um, so uh, there was a lecture about 3D printing this morning, 
And again, it's just a matter of time when we'll all be printing our drugs at home, uh, really. Uh, it won't happen probably next year, but hopefully in my lifetime. Uh, and um, that's, that's, that's something what we cannot avoid. And the question is how to test whether these drugs are really the drugs which we want to have and take and give our kids, uh, 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 for example, our, our patients in a, in a uh, um, situation when they need them. And uh, obviously, again, uh, referring to one of the previous lectures, what if the patient has multiple conditions, uh, diseases, influencing the uh, kinetics and dynamics of the drug? What if the patient is on several other uh, medications at the same time? How to combine it all together, how to inform the model, and how to predict the uh, outcomes? Um, which we can expect at the end of the day. So we have to have all of that to be able to predict the consequences of this um, drug, which is ad hoc, manufactured at home. So um, what I'm going to discuss very quickly is uh, the project which we've been working on recently about 3D printing uh, combined with very predictive dissolution and PPKPD modeling for the personalized therapy of Parkinson's disease. I'm not going to prove and, and uh, talk about the Parkinson's disease. I don't know if you noticed, but whoever is talking about any disease is trying to use the data and massage the data to prove that the disease is the most important one in the world. If it is diabetes, well, it's a second reason of death, and if it is cancer, it's the first, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to prove that Parkinson's disease is important. It can be important, especially for those who suffer from that. One of the um, consequence of Parkinson's disease is the drug will act differently and work differently as compared against healthy individuals. And that's something that we can to some degree at least uh, test uh, in vitro. Uh, why? Because we can mimic uh, the situation which influences from the absorption perspective, from the uh, gastrointestinal tract perspective, the behavior of the drug. So the esophagus, the, the stomach, the, the, the colon, small intestine will work differently. So the uh, um, activity of all those parts of the body will be different as compared against the health uh, volunteers. So even without going to the modeling and simulation, we can build a predictive system, an individual predictive system, which can try to mimic the situation for us. And that's the nice study which we published recently by uh, Dr. Klein and her group where they try to build a biopredictive dissolution system to mimic the Parkinson's disease in the flask and whether we can expect the differences when, it, when, when we compare the say, healthy flask versus the disease flask. It's an important step forward. Why? Because then we can use this data to inform the model and to try to understand what can be the uh, form of a dynamic outcome at the end of the day. That's something we were interested in. Pharmacokinetics is just the first step that we are interested in the pharmacodynamics within the effect, the clinical effect which we can expect. So we are not going to work, we are not going to discuss uh, levodopa, they, they focus on levodopa. Uh, I am going to focus on uh, raw, raw pinero. Why? Very simple reason, because it's relatively simple. Um, and that's, that's the only reason why we have picked up raw pinero. It's a PCS class 1. Uh, we do understand the pharmacokinetics. We do understand in general pharmacodynamics, at least to a certain degree. And as a first step, I think it was a good idea to work on something which is relatively simple as compared against more complex drugs. So we do follow uh, the typical approach. We collect the data. We are, we are trying to understand the drug. We are trying to understand its pharmacokinetics. Uh, we combine the information together, we feed uh, the proper platform uh, with the physical data, admin data, and stuff like that. And then we test whether the model works. I'm not sure whether we have eight or ten um, clinical trials which we use to uh, validate the model, but the validation has been done. And we can say that the pharmacokinetic is pretty much described. So we are you know, in a position where we can start thinking about using it in a real life scenario. But then the complexity starts, so the pharmacodynamic part really. So there are three elements which we need to understand pharmacodynamics of raw, raw pinyrol or any other drug which mimics do dopamine. So the first one is uh, what happens with the dynamics of dopamine or anything else what is mimicking its action. And it's really challenging. We think we know the system, 
um, but it's not true. Um, just to give you one example, we try to find information about the density of dopamine re receptor presynaptic and postsynaptic. There is no information about that, really. Nobody has measured that. Nobody has been tried. So uh, there are challenges. However, that's something what we need to know: how the drug binds the receptors. Then, what is happening in the basal ganglia? So how the dopamine and something what mimics dopamine really works. And then there is a first. Uh, excuse me, the third step, how to translate it to the, to the clinical outcome, something what is uh, simple to understand for, even for the patients, uh, for the medical doctor, for the ph uh, pharmacists, someone who will be a caregiver, someone who will be printing this 3D tablet in a moment for the patient uh, needed. So uh, in this case, relatively simple um, pharmacodynamic endpoint can be used, finger tapping. So how effectively people suffering from Parkinson's disease do move the finger and are able to tap something. So we can translate it uh, from the exposure through the situation at the, uh, say, uh, synaptic gap, then through the basal ganglia, up to the situation where we are measuring the finger tappings. And so uh, all we need to build a model which describes all these three elements and try to compare it or uh, correlate it with the uh, concentration of uh, the exposure of, of the drug. Once it's done, sorry, one too far. Once it's done, we can say we've got both elements which we need pharmacokinetics in the form of the PPPK model, validated, and we've got PD model or QSP model. Very mechanistic. I'm not sure of the equations. There's a bunch of equations there, uh, and then combination between both of them. And now we can try to start thinking about 3D printing, really. So what we can expect, and uh, how this 3D printing will help us to optimize the dose. So instead of what is available on the market, two milligram, four milligram, eight milligram, we believe, or we feel, or patient feels, or caregiver feels that this patient needs 1.1 milligram or 3.4 milligram. So something what can be printed ad hoc. So uh, that's exactly what uh, colleagues from my group are doing. So they're trying to understand this 3D printing stuff. Uh, with all the respect to anyone who's working on that, it only looks simple and sexy. It's not that simple and it's not that sexy. It's, it's really challenging. It's really challenging. Uh, we have a problem with uh, the size of the tablet. We have a problem with the shape of the tablet. We have a problem with multiple elements very basic stuff. Um, so that's one of the reasons why there's not so many 3D printed tablets accepted so far, even if it's been on the market for like 20 years now. Um, there are a lot of challenges which, which are connected with that. So uh, that's what we're doing. We're trying to understand what are the factors influencing the shape, uh, uh, hardness, uh, and so forth and so on, uh, of all the formulations which are printed. Then we are uh, running the uh, in vitro dissolution studies. We are trying to understand what we see as the in vitro dissolution and use it to feed the model, the PVPK model, um, to be able to predict uh, the output. So what was the first step, really, was to try to uh, test by equivalence between the 3D printed tablets and those which are already on the market. So we used uh, in vitro dissolution uh, study results, PVPK model, which has been uh, developed, which I very quickly described, uh, and then we followed the normal procedures. So we uh, thought about the bioequivalent study uh, setup, where it should be a uh, crossover or, or parallel number of individuals, uh, power of the study which was tested, and then uh, technical outcome uh, comparing reference versus test for multiple um, studies for multiple scenarios uh, tested. So now if we're in a position we can say that we understand that 3D printing for raw pineal, for this certain type of tablet, to the level which allows us to develop or print or manufacture at home, ad hoc, a tablet which is by equivalent. So what will be the next step? Uh, obviously go to the PD part and try to understand whether it really works. So this finger tapping, for example, or any other clinical outcome which we can think about uh, will be um, under control for the dose which we print at home. So we hope to run clinical trial um, at some stage. We'll see. It's more challenging than I expected, to be honest. 
um, publish and discuss uh, with the audience, like here, uh, just to make people aware that you know it, it, it sounds simple, it sounds obvious, you know, 3D printing uh, up to the clinical trials and clinical effect, but it's not that obvious. There are multiple things uh, in between which we have to understand. But at the end of, of the day, I strongly believe, and I see in the data and the results, that virtualization and modeling and simulation can really help. That, that's, that's exactly what it is for personalized therapy and pharmacotherapeutic equivalent in the form of 3D printed tablets, for example. Obviously, I haven't done any of that. It's all been done by my colleagues. By the way, uh, third thing which um, came to my mind during this meeting, so what is the difference between the student and the professor? So student know the answer for the question, and professor keep asking questions, but have no idea about the answers to these questions. I am trying to be a good professor, to be honest. So thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Why did you choose Opinable and not El Topa? At the end of the day, all Parkinsonian patients end up with El Topa. Yeah. And we know once the animal is over, you start with the legal, like the dual Topa, and you go through them, it's going to be minus in Israel, with the injection, with pump, etc. So why, why not do it? The procedural is easier from the pandemic perspective. So yeah, there you go. What's the only reason? Let's speak to the mic, then. sorry. So wrapping your roll is just easier from the pharmacokinetic perspective. The Vodopa is much more common. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that was the only reason. Not very scientific, sorry. Yes, Panos. No, no, no. So what we do, we collaborate with Krekos uh, Garbac from Physiolution. And uh, they develop this, this system which allows to mimic the GI tract. So we are trying to really run the biopredictive dissolution and develop the biopredictive dissolution study for the 3D printed tablet. Then we take the data and we simulate or we model the data. We're trying to understand what's behind the scene. What are the factors influencing the dissolution? So it's both actually. Experimental work plus modeling and simulation. But the first step is obviously in this case uh, experimental data, which we have. I agree. No, no, well, no I, I agree. So, uh, really, after spending like last two years on that, I've got much more questions than, than answers, much more reservations than solutions. Carl, yeah. Carl Beck. I don't think we will be able to do that. Uh, so again, I don't know if you agree with me, but we believe as, as a humanity that we know Parkinson's disease very well. We don't, really. We just think we do. And it's really uneasy to find a clinical endpoint, from a dynamic clinical endpoint, which is measurable and um, which we can model and simulate. So uh, most of the scores are uh, qualitative, not quantitative really, and the finger topic is the best what we can find and achieve at the moment. So coming back to your question, sorry, uh, short question, long, long answer, finger topic is the best what we have at the moment, and no, we, we don't know how to reach next step. Yeah. So I, I think we do know that the off-state is related to Dosing yeah, but and, and so, how to combine this mathematically? So we know that it depends on the dose, but we don't know. We don't have the correlation between them, as far as I know. So why choose that as a, so if I was trying to do, if I had the money, 
Uh, I'm kind of encouraged they're talking about gene free as, as, as something to continue at uh, different levels for different groups of people. Anything north of Manchester may be gene free. Mm -hmm. Probably Manchester as well. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I, I think these are, I think if I see, Sebastian, you, you, you're you mapping out a direction to go, but you're not, but you realize there are many hurdles, because we are generally an empirical, we're, we're hit by, primarily by empiricism, because when clinical management with medicines, of drug, you know, of medicines, is a practiced type of environment. So yes, we try to provide them with some tools, some basic knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when it comes to that, in the end, it's a feeling that we have. When I talk to my neurologist, for example, he tells me, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Let me tell you my experiences." Yeah. Get out of here. You've got to work against that. that yes. <laughs> That's the barrier, because you've got to make these points. I know, I know. Uh, yeah. So I'm not against in cerebral. I'm, no, no, I'm not against that. So that, that's something we're eventually all using, um, benefiting out of. But uh, still, um, I think there is a place for modeling and simulation. And I think we'll all um, notice at some stage that we'll have virtual patients in our smartwatches. It's just yeah. Like, uh, very short. I mean, yes. Very, very short. I don't think anybody is against in cerebral modeling. The problem, the problem that we have got, it introduces huge variability. Whoever I don't know, Malcolm, you know, Doctor GP is different than mine and different than somebody else. Yeah. Each of them, they have got their own in cerebral model, and that variability is unacceptable. Because one patient, you know, gets you no know, good treatment, the other one bad treatment. Yeah, uh, I mean, sorry, it's a very personal question. Your son is studying medicine, right? So I guess you've got a lot of good discussions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. We come to the, we come to the last session. Uh, sorry, the last speaker of the session two. And uh, that would be presented by Dr. Ucharma from Learn and Confirm Incorporation, Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Montreal, Canada. And the topic is Model Based Bioequivalence Approaches for Complex Generic Products. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank. Professor Macheras for inviting me to this uh, beautiful conference, beautiful city. Also to pay my scientific respect for Laszlo, who was uh, a friend of mine, uh, actually was such a nice man. Everybody in Canada loved him, I think, in the industry. Uh, very intelligent uh, person, very tenacious uh, sometimes, but uh, yeah, very good memories. So this is the plan of the presentation. We'll provide a background on uh, PK approaches for generic products. We'll talk about the different types of model-based bioequivalence approaches that you can use. We'll uh, provide examples of long-acting injectables. Uh, also uh, show you what a program for model-based BE could look like. We'll go step by step. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, different issues that we have related to this, uh, related to validation, but also availabilities of population PK models. So a model-based bioequivalence is um, any, uh, any time that you're using a model, basically, to come up with the pivotal assessment of equivalence. And uh, the USFDA was uh, instrumental in this and was really the, the first to push for model-based analysis. We can go back uh, uh, to the 1995 skin blanching guidance, which actually was the first one 
that was pushing for a model-based analysis of the pilot data, uh, but also through the IVIVC guidelines, uh, more recently the uh, product individual guidance of Orlistat and our bureau that ask for uh, those scale analysis, which is basically you use a model-based analysis for that. A model integrated B is basically a type of submission. So this is a term that comes from the USFDA, the Office of Genetic Drugs. And it's whenever in your submission you have a model-based uh, biocovalence approach, then it's called a model integrated B submission. And an example of that is the example that uh, Anin and others have mentioned today, is the submission of diclofenac gel from a few years ago that used a PBPK virtual B uh, assessment. And you can find uh, more details in a paper that is uh, written by Dr. Liang Zhao and his colleagues at uh, the Office of Generic Drugs. So when do we use those? We use model-based analysis when it's not possible to, do, to use a standard approach. So essentially, if it's not feasible from a clinical point of view, for example, if we're going to be talking about long-acting injectables, uh, some of those long-acting injectables, it takes years, takes years before you achieve pharmacokinetic steady state. And so because of that, doing a standard bioequivalent study could take like five years, which is really uh, almost impossible. We've also used model-based analyses um, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to basically rescue studies where there have been some, uh, some difficulties in recruitment because of lockdowns. And with model-based analyses, we've basically proven that the study was still uh, discriminative. And so obviously there's other reasons, technical point of view, if the standard approach would not be robust enough, and practical point of view, we mentioned the PBPK virtual BE for Daclofenac gel. Now the, uh, there are many types of product for which model-based BE can be useful. Um, suffice it to say that uh, the Office of Generic Drugs defines a group of products as complex generic drug products. So model-based analyses are very useful for, for, all of the, for all of them. So that includes long-acting injectables, liposomal product, oncology products where the administration is complicated uh, via different dosing cycles. So the dosing cycle number one can be very different than the dosing cycle number two, meaning that a crossover standard design cannot be uh, used. Uh, and also implants. Long-acting injectables are therefore injectable products that are modified release and they liberate their active ingredient over a very long time period. Uh, in this table, you have different examples of products that are available on the market as an oral formulation. So that's the middle part of the table. We can see that all of those products can be given once or twice a day. And they're also available in a long-acting injectable formulation. And now instead of giving it once a day, you may only need to give it once every three months. In PK, we usually want to do studies in healthy volunteers, comparing single-dose administrations, because we've used single-dose PK data to be more discriminative of formulation performance. And so when we do those type of studies, we use the non-compartmental PK method, which I can call an observed type of method in this occurrence, because I'm going to compare the observed Cmax between the test and the reference, the observed AUC. Now for long-acting injectables, because most of the time they can only be given to patients, uh, because they would be too toxic, they would stay too long for, uh, to be able to be given to healthy volunteers, you cannot do a single dose design because once you start the patient on the product, then you have to continue. So basically, you want to be able to do a steady state design 
so normally at steady state, we look at Cmax, the observed Cmax at steady state, or the AUC over the dosing interval at steady state. The problem with long-acting injectable, again, is that some of them, um, the uh, release half-life, which or I can call the absorption half-life when we fit the data, sometimes is so slow, it becomes a flip-flop product, that um, steady state is only achieved after years of dosing. And so because of that, you cannot do a crossover. You have to do a parallel when you can do it. If you have to do a parallel design, then sample size will be based on the inter-CV and not on the intra-CV. And so boom, for those type of products, you need a study with 300 patients. On this table is presented uh, two main examples of long-acting injectables. I'm going to start by the outlier, if I can say, Depo-Provera. Depo-Provera is a uh, long-acting injectable that you inject once every three months, progesterone to pre, uh, for uh, pregnancy uh, prevention. And so that one is different than the other ones because you can administer it in a population of healthy volunteers, which in this case are postmenopausal women. So, so with this product, you don't need a model base because it's feasible to find 300 postmenopausal women. It's difficult, but feasible. And do a study looking, uh, you know, after a single dose administration. Uh, after that, uh, here on this table, we have one month um, long-acting injectable product, so paliperidone palmitate, which is called Invega Sustena, or the Aripiprazole, which is called Abilify Maintenance, so those are antipsychotics. And so here in the middle part of the table, I wrote what would be a conventional standard design that you would have to do, either a parallel or a crossover. If you want to do a parallel because of the time it takes to reach steady state, you need to do a seven month study. And uh, so that's difficult but feasible. But the problem becomes that because the inter CV is greater than 60%, then you need to study 360 patients, which is not really feasible. So that's why I wrote it in red. When it's red, it's not really feasible. The crossover is not feasible because it would take seven months for the test and seven months for the reference, even without thinking of a dedicated washout or anything. In contrast, if you do a model-based analysis, analysis, you can do a crossover and you can reduce the timeline, the duration of your study by two to three times. So in this case, you can do a study four months where you're going to give, uh, for example, two, two different sequences here, RRTT, TTRR, and you can either analyze the data using the average biocovalence approach, in which you would need to finish with at least 52, 52 patients, or with the scale, where you would need to finish with more than 24. The case for Invega Trinza is even more compelling. Invega Trinza is given once every three months. And this is a very, very slow delivery of the active ingredient. Uh, so it's almost impossible to reach steady state before really 18 months. So even right there, even the parallel design becomes impossible in terms of study duration in patients. Um, if you want to do a model-based analysis, this duration can be dropped to 12 months. Uh, again, it would be a crossover, and you would need to finish with those types of numbers. So when we do model-based analyses, uh, in my presentation here, I'm going to focus on population PK approach, which we call PPK. With population PK, we're fitting the data. We don't need the data to be just at single dose or just at steady state. The data can be over any number of doses, so I can have data after the second, third, etc. I'm going to have data from the test and from, from the reference product. I'm going to fit them very carefully with a population PK model, and I'm going to get two different sets of results from that population PK analysis. 
I will get the individual fitted results, and I will get the population prediction results. With the first sets of results, the individual PK ones, what I can do in a model-based analysis is just simply continue dosing in silico those same exact patients. And I can continue dosing them in silico to whichever design I want. So if I want to have a single dose design, I can continue this in silico with a washout, or I can continue dosing in silico to a steady state design. So that's what we called continuing dosing in silico. That's the, you know, uh, the first model-based analysis you can do. The second one you can do is use the population prediction part of the model and then do virtual BE. So in virtual BE, I will basically come up with virtual patients and I will, let's say, simulate a thousand different studies, test versus reference, and then assess biocovalence or not. So we have those two main types. Um, the continuation in silico, I'm going to need a population PK model for this. The nice thing about this method is that the B is actually based on actual clinical data, not based on any virtual patients. The validation is simpler because it's actually very easy to show that the fit is perfect. Okay? Uh, but then on the downside, obviously, I need to have a clinical sample size with the power that I want. So if I want to have 80% power and it needs 60 patients, I'm going to have to dose 60 patients. I cannot compensate with virtual patients. In contrast, the virtual BE is the contrary. The nice thing about it is that my clinical study may be very small, and then uh, I'm going to simulate patients with much higher number of patients. Now, the, the downside to this is that in practice, it's very difficult or almost impossible to come up with models that can predict at the level that normally we want in biocovalence, which is plus or minus 80%, or plus or minus 20%, sorry. And for this virtual BE, I can use the population PK or a PBPK model. Now, in the population PK uh, analysis, I mentioned that we have two different sets of results. We have the individual fitted results and the population prediction results. But we also have what we call the residual variability. The residual variability is basically whatever is not explained by the model. And so it's some sort of a noise, if you will. But this number is very important in terms of model-based analysis. Because if we want to establish bioequivalence at plus or minus 20%, then this residual variability has to be a maximum of 20%. If you have a residual variability of 50%, it will not be possible to pass at plus or minus 20. So you need a population PK analysis and a, a model with very low residual variability. Now you've uh, probably seen in the table that I presented, I've only been talking about crossover design for model-based analysis. This is simply because it is preferred because when you do a crossover design, then really the only theoretical difference between the test and the reference are only in the rate and extent of absorption or delivery of, if you want, if you're talking about the uh, long-acting injectable. The systemic part of the model stays the same. So because of that, the analysis becomes more robust. So it means that if I want to use average bioequivalence, then at the minimum, I may have a two-way crossover design like this, two sequences, TR, RT. Or if I want to use the scaled average, it would need to have those two sequences, RT, RT, or TR, TR. Now, for some products, long-acting injectables, even though they may be given every month, for example, every 28 days, for some of those products, the absorption is actually so slow that you cannot capture 
at least two half life of the absorption or the delivery in that 28 days, which means that at the minimum, you need to look at the PK over at least two months. Okay, so for some products, it complicates things and the model-based analysis takes a little bit longer time. So in those cases, if I could not look at uh, the PK over one dosing interval, I would have to expand the dosing interval here by two uh, dosing interval. Now the first thing uh, when we want to do model-based analysis is that we need to know if we have a population PK model that exists in the literature. And this population PK model needs to have certain, um, how do I say it? Huh? Uh, or certain criteria or certain, uh, you know, things need to be known. So we need to know completely all of the population PK parameter means. We need to know the inter-CV of all of the parameters. And we need a low residual variability. We need, a, again, a residual variability maximum of 20% because we want to establish bioequivalence at plus or minus 20. If we are interested in doing the scaled average bioequivalence uh, in, uh, for the United States, then we need one more thing in that population PK model is that it needs to have inter-occasion variability built in for some or all of the PK parameters. Now the problem is, is that most of the population PK models that have been published and that are actually part of the NDA for approval of the reference product are deficient. Most of them, they don't have the inter-occasion um, variability. And also, most of them have very high residual variability. And again, if the residual variability is 50%, it will be impossible to establish bioequivalence at plus or minus 20. So a lot of those population PK model, as part of your program that you're going to do, you will have to redo them and basically fix whatever needs to be fixed. So let's say I have this population PK model that has inter-occasion variability, it has low residual variability. Now what I want to do is find out what is the innovative clinical study design that would be discriminative and successful. And I'm going to tell the agency, here is the study design that I'm going to do using a model-based analysis. And to do that, what we do is that we simulate thousands of studies with a test formulation that would be bioequivalent to the reference and we simulate according to different study design and if I'm supposed to have a power of 80% then I need to get a power of 80% if I get a power of 90% that's not good if I get a power of 70% that's not good and then I also need to show that my innovative study design is discriminative so I do the same analysis and I look at the alpha error. The alpha error needs to be controlled at less than 5%. When we do this, we also, this alpha error and power assessment for a standard design, even though that design may not be feasible. And so if we show that it's successful, then we can continue. We can basically submit this to the Office of Generic Drug. We request a product development meeting and uh, we've met with uh, the Office of Generic Drugs for multiple programs and they've been extremely useful. Um, uh, they had excellent uh, suggestions, very open-minded, so th this, uh, this is really uh, something that has been beneficial. Once the Office of Generic Drugs approve your plan, they approve the clinical the innovative clinical study design you're going to do, they approve how you're going to assess bioequivalence uh, using your model based B, then you just do it. So for example, here let's say it would be a four-way uh, four design in uh, 24 subjects, then the first thing you do is that you fit all the individual data to your population PK model, you get all of the different uh, PK parameters in every patient, 
you validate what you obtain. So in order to be validated, the fit has to be perfect. So here you have a line of identity between observed and fitted. It really needs to be perfect. You look at the exposure metrics that you have, Cmax, AUC, uh, for different time intervals. You compare that to the fitted. Again, needs to be perfect. So then if it's validated, you can therefore continue in silico dosing to those exact same patients, and then you assess equivalence using standard uh, statistical criteria. Now this uh, population PK model that we've talked about, I'm going to repeat myself here, but it needs to be fit for purpose for B. So it depends on the purpose of the study. So the, is this study, does this study needs to be discriminative? Uh, so does, does it need to be at plus or minus 20%? So if it does, then you need to have, again, this population PK model with very low residual variability, maximum 20%. But in some circumstances, in some cases, regulators are asking for studies that may be supportive instead of completely discriminative. And so that plus or minus 20% may therefore be expanded in certain cases. So it may be uh, considered appropriate, for example, to have you know uh, plus or minus 50%. And so in those cases, then the virtual BE uh, can be possible. Otherwise, uh, virtual BE is almost impossible in my experience to be able to establish plus or minus 20%. So again, population PK analysis, we have those three sets of results. If we want to do the continuation in silico, we are going to use the fitted uh, the fitted individual results, and we need a low residual variability. When we want to do virtual BE, we're going to use the population prediction side of the results with also uh, an appropriate uh, residual variability. And so now come to the current issue. So we've already mentioned that one of the problem is that the population PK models that usually have been developed for the reference product or usually deficient, five minutes, okay, are usually deficient um, in terms of either they don't have inter-occasion variability or they have a residual variability that's too high. So this needs to be fixed. And so because, um, you know, we need to show the USFDA that we've tested different innovative clinical study design and we need to come up with the one that is discriminative and successful, theoretically we need the population PK model that we're going to need at the end, but most of the time we don't. Um, and so th this, is, this is a problem that uh, with model-based analyses, it becomes quite a long journey because you have to do a lot of work before you can do your pivotal study and you have to do a lot of work after. And so if regulators are accepting studies that may not be as discriminative but are shorter, then it's just simpler to just follow what the regulators want. Uh, now, of course, for Trinza, I don't think it's possible. And I think for Trinza, the only possibility is to do a model-based analysis. So in summary, we've, uh, we've seen that model-based uh, BE approaches are very useful for many products, including long-acting injectables. We've uh, discussed the two main types of model-based BE. We've uh, also looked at step-by-step -step what you would need to do to be able to file such a program to the USMTA. And uh, we've also talked about uh, issues, current issues related to those programs. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Thank you. Let me ask a very heretical question. Yes. Okay, so we need to be at steady state or we need to have a population PK model if we want to know clearance or if we want to know bioavailability. But that's not what we're interested in. 
What we want to know is bioequivalent. Why do we have to be in steady state? Why do we have to have the total area under the curve? Why don't we just don't have take to... the third dose, take multiple samples during the third dose, and show equal exposure? That will give us the right answer. You mean without a model base? Right. No model. Just instead of, you know, I have this long acting thing that takes a long time, and I'm giving it every six months. So after a year and a half or something, people taking it, just during that next six month period, so you've given some time for accumulation, you just compare the areas under the curve during that time interval. Why do we need to be at steady state? And why do we even need a population PK line? Well, uh, I mean, you can, uh, we've tested that. I, I mean, I agree in some of the things you, you're, you're mentioning. Uh, but also from a practical point of view, it would be difficult, right? Because you would you would have certain patients after, let's say, what did you say, a year and a half or whatever, then other ones. And so the study would take quite a long time and you would use different lots of the reference product, which is something that the regulators are not used to, right? Because in bioequivalence, they want you to use one lot. Yeah, but during the time interval. So but, and, and two hours, two year time. But interval. but you still have to reach steady state. Why? Because if you're not at steady state, um, I mean we've tested it actually to tell you the truth, and and the alpha error is is larger than five percent when you use the standard design. Uh, I don't believe it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't believe it. I, I, what you want to do is. <coughs> Have exposure be the same. That's bioequivalent. It doesn't need right. to be at steady state. Yeah, but if you're not at steady state, let's say because this, those release are very complicated. Okay, so you have multiple absorption, but multiple delivery process. Some time. of them have very, very slow half life. Some of them has, have a greater half life. So you may not see it at the month that you're picking. You but see what I mean? Cares. What do you mean what you care is because you're going to have a difference at city state. No. You, yes, you will. Yes, you will. You show me, you show me in a model that I can look at the third dose and I will get a different answer than I look at steady state. I, the I, I can send you, I, I can send you, like for example, for in Vegas, Sustena, we've compared looking at bioequivalence after the fourth dose, the fifth dose, the seventh dose, and before the seventh dose, we have an inflation of the alpha error. I can, I can send you that. Okay, I can send it to you. Okay, let's see. Think about the superposition principle of, of dose, like we think you do. Either, either we are in comparing in the single dose or in steady state, both in the saturation. Yeah, but that's only to get clearance and bioavailability. That isn't what we're interested in bioavailability. But you have AUC, right? The AUC over that dosing interval is equivalent to the AUC in for the first dose. No, 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 it is not. Only at steady state. Yes, at steady state. But that's what I'm saying. But you don't need to know that for bioavailability. You need to have the overall you AUC. The you, need, you need to know the overall AUC you do difference. Not for bioavailability. That's what I'm saying. In the interest of time, last question, short question, short answer. Sure. I hope it is short. In all the population models that you are projecting forward, you said that you have to look at what the population model is there, but for the simulation of that population, you need the correlation matrix of the parameters. As far as I know, out of the 200 of PK that we looked at, only two or three of them, they were reporting the correlation matrix. How do you deal with that? Um, what I would say is now the Office of Generic Drugs, they always ask for the full matrix. Because, uh, because you know, they, they, for the confidence interval, they want you to be based on the standard error and that is reported for every parameter, the uncertainty. And uh, so, so it's not a concern anymore, but I do agree with you in the published data that it's deficient. Okay. Thank you very much for very interesting discussion. <laughs> now we move on to the, the next very important session while we are all here. And that's a special session 
in honor of Dr. Laszlo Andrei, and that will be moderated by Dr. Imre Klavovic and Dr. Halsen. Okay, I have the great privilege of starting off. Uh, if you stop to think about it, we are all experiencing a very special joy. We are here together, even enduring less is screaming at you. It's a joyous moment because we're sharing ideas, we're experiencing camaraderie, we're telling each other about our families and their progress, and. Uh, it will be a great memory, very enriching to us. But it's important to stop for a while and think about the shoulders on which we have stood, as Newton said. So today we have, we have a few minutes to remember Laszlo. And I'd like to just give you a very brief anecdote about my interaction with Laszlo. 1972, I was a fresh fellow trained in internal medicine, studying at the University of California, San Francisco under Lou Shiner, trying to grasp uh, modeling and simulation and forecasting of individual patient pharmacokinetics. And we first used a frequentist regression approach, and then Lou said, we're going to use Bayesian. And I thought, what is that? I heard about it when I did a math degree, but it just wasn't in my toolbox. So I wondered how do you actually estimate the posterior parameters of a, of a model uh, that you have uh, set as your, as your baseline. And uh, Lou actually couldn't explain it to me very well. He had a frequentist uh, reduction approach that we were going to be using. Uh, but he or someone said, Laszlo Andrenyi is here. Why don't you ask him? Now, there's debate about why he was doing here or if he was actually there, but I can confirm you, confirm that he was there. And so I approached Laszlo and I said, you know, tell me, how do you do this? And without hesitation, he said, well, you should use a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation to get the posterior distributions. This was like way over my head. So he patiently explained this to me, and I thought, well, okay, we'll do that. But we didn't have uh, powerful computers at the time. In fact, when I checked to see if we could use the CDC 7600 over at Berkeley, they said, well, you have a lot of IBM cards that you're going to have to type up. Uh, but we really weren't there. And it was only 20 years later or so that the computational capability um, you know, caught up. And so I credit Laszlo with really foreseeing the future and explaining that to me. And he was ever so patient, such a wonderful man. We later bettered uh, about uh, my idea about a randomized controlled trial, which he was critical. And uh, we enjoyed that interaction as well. So I just want to say uh, Laszlo really influenced uh, my early thinking about Bayesian estimation, and that's why I blasted off this afternoon telling you about how it has an application in, in modeling simulation, and we use, definitely we use the Markov chain, Monte Carlo approach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to say it's many thanks to Panos for this organized this memory session for this conference. I think it is very, very important for us. Uh, because it's hearing it's a lot of person to a very good, friendly connection with Laszlo, and we are connected here. And uh, it had to be remembered because he was a fantastic man. My friendship started 35 years ago with Laszlo, and I 
prepared some slides for this slide and uh, prepared from slides from the photos in our private photo archives. And sorry, I continuously there. Only maybe if you come on this side, then you can see all the pictures. Right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Charman and Veronica is widow Laszlo is connected with us from Zoom through the internet. I think it's the uh, first part of this uh, slide presentation. I want to uh, summarize this last little scientific life. This milestone in this career of Laszlo, it's growing in 19. This. Is born in Budapest, 1933, and he started in the. Is the microphone on? Okay. Thank you, thank you. He started the university studies in Faculty of Chemistry Engineering in the Technical University in Budapest. In 1956, uh, in Diploma Engineer, we became in the Diploma of Faculty of Chemi Chemistry Engineering in Technical University. Parallel, he did teaching in Mathematics Studies, as therefore, it was very good established to the uh, Biostatistics and the other topic. The PhD stages already in Canada started because the Russian uh, coming to Hungary and the revolution is had to, after the revolution is had to left out in Hungary and uh, he started the PhD studies, uh, the addition of methyl, lattins uh, and ethylene's topic and Department of Chemistry, University of Toronto. Why it was it's a very important his life? Because he was in the chemical engineer and mathematics, and both together, it's after the PhD thesis, it was a big change in his scientific career. He was working from 1966 in University of Toronto, from uh, in Department of Pharmacology in variation position. First, we became in 1978, we became a full professor. And 91 to 92, acting director of biostatistics program. And 90, 1988 to 93, associate dean of the graduate studies. It was changing his uh, life is very important in the former uh, scientific life. Nin uh, 94 to 97, government council member will became. And uh, 95 to 97, in academic board members will be. And from 98, uh, Professor Emeritus till his passed away. The second is a career, it's a scientific field, it's continuously from 1981 to 84, Board of Direction and American Statistical Association. I think it's changing and dramatically his, his uh, life. From 2002 to 2005, Chair of Bioequivalence uh, Focus Group, American Association for Pharmaceutical Sciences in AAPS. 2005 to 
2003-2018 International Advisory Board member of several uh, scientific conferences, this e.g. the Bioequivalence Workshop Series, SRACD Series, ICIP in Hungary, and the several other conference uh, in global. 2010-2011 present by president in the Canadian Society for Pharmaceutical Sciences. Unfortunately, uh, 2020 in December passed away in Toronto. Several honors and prize and medal is was uh, in Laszlo. Sodala Modonis Kalza and Isekus Béla Award and Medal of the Hungarian Society for Experimental and Clinical Pharmacology, 2002. Dr. Honoris Kalza in Semmelweis University, Budapest, 2009. Lifetime Achievement Award of the Canadian Society of Pharmaceutical Sciences, in 2014, and posthumous lifetime achievement award from Frankfurt Foundation Quality of Medicines. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the full uh, life, the scientific part and the private part, and he was a fantastic good man, good friends, and so on and so on. And uh, from Veronica and our photo archive, I want to collect some photos from Laszlo, from the childhood to the diet. You can see in the childhood, this was fantastic in Budapest, in this the left side uh, photos is four years old, after the basic school, you can see the third line and the end of the line, and is I think it was a very very clever young people. The next one in the secondary school graduation is was 18 years old. The next one we are a big step. It's uh, he go to the young scientist at the University of Toronto, and uh, you can see the photos in the chemical laboratorium it was uh, uh, very active under the PhD life and after it unfortunately it's a big dream period it's not so lot of photos and from this one I want to show you for the our uh, photo collections invited plenary speaker was in several conferences. You can see the smile and this is a very intelligent face. It can be seen in every, every moment and every cases. And this is a mindset sharpens favorite speaker. You can see this is a typical uh, moment from the last law. And the next one, I think it's the most memorable moments of social events, a different type of Hungarian conferences. I collected with a lot of people, uh, it's all together, it was meeted and was for everybody. It's a lot, lot of good words and a lot of smile. It was a fantastic man. And I think it was a several position. It's a poster award board member and president. It's everything. It was a positive attitude in our life. And now the most memorable moments of post-conference tour in Hungarian conferences I collected in near the lake of Balaton and in the middle picture it is a fantastic nice uh, uh, post-conference tour in the Fertut Esterházy Castle 
and the right side you can see is Saint Andre. This is a beautiful small town in the riverside. And the post conference dinner, it's with the gypsy music. Uh, it was a very, very nice atmosphere. As you remember, in several places, sit here. I think in the next slide, it was very important in our life. It's a family, a private life. The first wife is died, unfortunately, in cancer, and after it, 24 years living alone, and after it is connected his life with Veronica. And it was a wonderful uh, period his uh, life. I connected and collected some picture together with Veronica. And uh, I think is uh, you can see the bottom of the right picture is was in the Hungarian Parliament, and uh, it was the Bayakulance workshop is uh, 2014. And uh, the next uh, figure, the recognition. I he got a lot of recognition, but. Unfortunately, we could found, could not found in every, every medal and award some pictures. But the most important, the Sodalen Honoris Causa and Ishekut's award and medal of the Hungarian Society of Experimental and Clinical Pharmacology from 2002. Uh, it's a uh, backside is middle of the Hungarian Academy of Science president. I think it's both together to give this medal and award. 2014 Lifetime Achievement Award, the Canadian Society for Pharmaceutical Sciences. He was very happy because it's very uh, few people is got this uh, medal and award. And from 2016, the Diamond Jubilee degree, uh, Budapest University of Technical Economics. You can see this is a chemical engineer, especially a 60 years old diploma in our hands. It's not so. Uh, everybody is leave this time, you know. The next one. It's Dr. Honoris Causa in Semmelweis University, Budapest, in 2009. It's a rector in the uh, left uh, top photo, give the, the documentation, and uh, it has a ceremonial photo in the <coughs> Senatus room in every year when what the person this highest uh, degree in the Semmelweis University. And the middle picture, it's uh, Laszlo in the Semmelweis paint, also in the uh, Semmelweis, uh, Semmelweis rectorate uh, room. And uh, the right side is write some uh, memory to the special book of the university. And the last one, unfortunately, 2021, one and a half years ago, in Postumus Lifetime Achievement Award from Frankfurt Foundation Quality of Medicine. Several people in this room is, were been in this one. It's Veronica, uh, it's a widow, is got this the Postumus Lifetime Award. And from Professor Henry Blume and his wife, it's also it has in the picture. And one to summarize, it's a quality life, it's which is the most important for us from Laszlo, he, as he lives in our memories. Highly respect the research and a trailblazer in the field of pharmacokinetics. 
internationally recognized expert of biostatistics, bioequivalence, and biosimilarity studies. And therefore, many thanks again for uh, Panos who organized here this session in this conference. Editorial board member of several highly ranked scientific journals, more than 15. Bioequivalence, biostatistic consultant in the Health Canada, FDA, and several pharmaceutical companies in globally. And it was the scientific. And now I collected this the man uh, thing. Cultural man with the great sense of humor. And very, very few people is know. Loving a classical music originally and based it in the career as conductor. When I meet it in Toronto, only classical music is can be hearing in the car radio, you know. And at home, only the classical music is can be hearing also. This was, it's a parallel to life in our 88 years period. Laszlo was a true Renaissance pers uh, personality because the science both together with the, the cultural thing and the paints and the music all together. And Laszlo was loving husband and true friends. I'm sorry, it's, it can be seen in completely moving these slides and therefore the last line, I don't know why, is could not uh, sharpest can be seen. Uh, she will presence in memory of his gentle, smiling personality. And the next uh, figure and slides, I found a fantastic good photos in our photo archives. You, you can see in the Danube side and the restaurant the beautiful professor, the king of biostatistics and pharmacokinetics. You know, I think it was Laszlo, it's a very simple but very clever and a super person. And the last of the presentation, I want to acknowledgement to special thank to Veronica Torna and Rényi for the childhood and family photos because unfortunately I wasn't in our photo archives. And the last figure, let's remember for Laszlo, from the Glock and the smile and the blue flower. Many, many thanks, and thank you for your kind attention, and thank you for Panos for inviting for this presentation. Thank you very much. Use the mic so that she can hear you. Use the mic. Yes. Dear Veronica, many, yes. many, many yes. thanks as you are connected for this memorial session. And I hope you could see is every slides and everybody as well. And yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. I want to thank you, and Laszlo, I'm sure, smiling down from heaven to us, and I really appreciate that you dedicated this conference to his memory. I am eternally grateful, and thank you, Imre, thank you so much. You summarize it so well, his scientific and his personal virtues. I am eternally grateful for this. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, Panos, very much for organizing this conference in his memory. It's a great honor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And 
I prepared to you the all photos as you told in telephone conversation to you when you come to Budapest the next time. And I asked to Panos, it's a conference uh, printed program also for you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Imre. You've done a marvelous job like always. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending this meeting uh, dedicated to Laszlo. We will always remember this kind scientist, a lovely friend. So it's time if somebody likes to say something for Laszlo, I think he can say some words. If you like, please. Okay. Les Bennett likes to say something. I had the pleasure. I, I don't remember Laszlo being at UCSF. You was there. But I did interact with Laszlo many times, both in writing and in interaction. Specifically, I chaired the uh, Individual Bioequivalence Committee for the FDA which was a combination of FDA scientists and experts. And Laszlo was on that committee. And Laszlo and I did a very good job of saying, let's don't do individual bioequivalents. So Laszlo and I were in complete agreement that that is what we should not do. Roger Williams, who appointed us, was, of course, very disappointed. But Laszlo had the right idea and had the basis for the correct interpretation. Other person who want to give some words? Hi. Hi, Veronica. Hi. Hi. Steph and I send our very best wishes to you. And of course, we all remember Laszlo. He was a great guy. We'll miss him. Thank you. Okay. Somebody, Attila. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Attila. Well, Laszlo was not on the track. As Imre mentioned, he was really an exceptional person for everything for us who was a good friend, who was really an ami, and also sometime as father he embraced us, and sometime who was an exceptional teacher for all of us. I met him first time I don't remember exactly the year, 82 or 83, in NATO Erice Sicily meeting. In, in Italy, yes. yes. And uh, this period really was an exceptional period for me and the young people during this period because including Laszlo, Wagner, and Aldo from Italy, from Columbia University, was there. And uh, following years, we were together with our colleagues in different occasions, different uh, places of the uh, world, particularly pharmacokinetic meetings or related meetings. And uh, today, if I have some pharmacokinetic uh, knowledge, who was one of the important person adding to this knowledge. Uh, I appreciate a lot what he did for pharmaceutical science, and uh, we will never forget him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Attila. Thank you, Attila. Thank you very much. Helmut, I, I remember Laszlo as the most supporting person I ever met, 
because when I had some crazy ideas and I talked to him about that, and I thought they are not re really worth it, he always responded with, I'm so enthusiastic, you have to publish. <laughs> and afterwards, he gave me a hard time review reviewing our manuscript. <laughs> and I gave him a hard time reviewing his. <laughs> so this is just, I miss you. Thanks. Thanks, hello, Thank you. Other one? So, uh, okay, if nobody else likes to say something, Marco, okay. Veronica, we have not met before, so, but I know the passion he had for his marriage. Uh, I interacted with, uh, and like Les, I don't remember, I was at UC SF at the time, teaching Carl and teaching Lewis and everything, the fellows. Your memories are Yeah, yeah, well, you're, 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 you must have come, he must have sneaked into the department, never interacted with us. That's all I can say is, no, no, otherwise I wouldn't remember. Okay, Carl. But I, I always remember, I saw Laszlo, Periodically, I didn't interact with him intimately, but I uh, saw him interact with, uh, in AAPS and AAPHA meetings in the late 70s, early 80s. That's what I remember with me. Too. And so we meet from time to time, and I always found him as a refined person with, a, with an amazing sense of humor and a glint in his eye. And I enjoyed the interactions with him although I was not involved with the statistics, you know, with them. but uh, I have very fond memories of him. A, a true, a, in many ways, a true European. You know, in many ways, he didn't lost his accent anyway. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you very much all. Okay, we will always remember Blaslo. Thank you very much for being with us, Veronica. Okay. Thank you. Hope to see you in not too distant future. All right. So, thank you. Thank you I Anna. thank you so much. Thank you very much. I am very honored. Thank you, Vera. You put connected for us. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you, Indra. Bye bye. Thank bye. you all. Thank you so bye. much. You put us in a very long day, man. <laughs> and we are elderly people here, you know, etc. Uh, huh? We are a very good student. No, we are, we are, we are robust as your AUC and your statistics, man. No, no, no. I know, I know. So, and in addition to the dessert, I was just told that the two last lectures are resumed, so you can all fall asleep. There's no, you know, personal courtesy. But before doing so, uh, it's a pleasure. With my, you know, my co-chair and mentor Les Bennett, and to co-chair the last session and the long virtual entitled the virtualization, and the first speaker, the only non-virtual speaker that will speak in person, I hope, is uh, Dr. Tongeli Lee uh, from University of Purdue, the Boilmakers, right, uh, West Lafayette, uh, Indiana. 
and his, type, his lecture is in, entitled Decoding of the Chemistry with Manifold Embedding and Predicting Dry Developability with Deep Learning. That's very, very sophisticated. <laughs> so we look forward. Uh, good chance that we'll not fall asleep. Right. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Well, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Well, thanks a lot again for the kind introduction. Um, again, I'm from uh, Purdue University, not uh, University of Purdue, but uh, you may not hear Purdue either. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, thank the panels for the uh, kind invitation to be here. And uh, actually, I know panels for probably more than 20 years. Uh, when I actually was a student at Purdue University, I was working on uh, so-called fractal analysis of surface. Uh, of AFM, um, the panels actually w was invited and gave a talk on the uh, fractal dimension, use fractal dimension to the uh, from kinetics. And uh, I was uh, amazed because I didn't know that there was a second person who actually doing a fractal in pharmaceutical area. So since then we, we stay in friend uh, as friends. So thanks for your invitation and hospitality. And uh, this is actually my first time being here. Um, I'm actually not a uh, training in pharmacokinetics. I'm training in chemistry and uh, computer science and pharmaceutics. Uh, but I do enjoy the meeting so far. I, you know, I, I like math, uh, not too much, but uh, you know, I, I can see there are so many things we share in common. You know, data, model, and all that. Um, you know, I, I have seen, um, you know, actually mathematics. You know, some, sometimes when people see equations. Doing the presentation, we got scared. Um, but uh, you know, I, I enjoy Greek letters in you know, all those equations. Uh, but I have to acknowledge, you know, I came here last night. I seen so you know more Greek letters you know on streets than my whole life. So I, I'm looking forward again to the uh, to the conference. Okay, so here is really the outline of my talk. Um, um, I think early, early this morning, somebody mentioned actually the, the, the really essence of our drug discovery data development is mathematics, right, from kinetics, all that. So from my perspective, I think all, you know, the uh, discovery development can be boiled down to multiple interactions, right? Whether it's, you know, interaction with the API excipients or a ligand with, with proteins, right? Everything is about multiple interactions. And they, uh, so I, when I started my career, I should look use quantum mechanics to, to study intermodal interactions. Then there was time about 10 years ago, I really run into this frustru uh, frustru uh, frustration about actually called the curse of dimensionality. Right? And uh, so since COVID actually we developed the concept of so-called manifold embedding. Right? Then recently we apply that to many, many different kinds of uh, predictions including solubility predictions. And uh, so on the right, you can see actually we calculate the electron structures or electron density of the molecule. In this case, actually it's crystal, right? And you can think about you know, electron density or all the properties, maybe some kind of information, right? So my, actually my research is really about how can we capture right, that information to understand and even predict molecular interactions. The title actually I changed, um, you know, originally it's only encoding of the information, but I actually add, uh, sorry, decoding. I also add encoding, right? Since uh, actually one uh, panels as a, as a talk from a uh, uh, title of my talk, I only gave encode, uh, decoding. But since last uh, few months, actually our concept has evolved significantly. And that's why, hopefully, later on I can see why I also mentioned it's uh, encoding and decoding. Okay. Um, so this one, I, I don't need to repeat myself. Uh, once again, it's everything is involved multiple interactions. Uh, two things, right? One is the strength, right? Between two molecules, how strong they can bind. Another one is specificity, right? Uh, for specificity, uh, in terms of uh, uh, and why I was first looking at intermodal interaction in solid state is also related to so-called locality, right? 
So the same molecule, why they pack differently, right? Not only strength, but locality, okay? And they, uh, so you may see, actually, again, uh, in the middle, I actually calculate a lot of, uh, you know, molecular uh, electronic type of interactions. And they, uh, uh, classically, right, people use the, uh, you know, the uh, Schrodinger equation to describe energy and the uh, different states uh, of, of molecular systems. Um, so it's, right now, you know, if we're looking back, the Schrodinger equation, right, is really a very beautiful eigen equation, right? It's eigen equation. You have eigen function, you know, molecular orbitals, and also eigen values, they are energies, right? And uh, so it's really a beautiful equation. Um, and I, I mean, definitely you guys, I applied mathematician, you should be able to see the beauty. And for, for quantum mechanics, you know, I think the challenge thing, people actually already figured that out, is, is, is really the wave functions, right? So how can we apply the operator on wave functions? So nonetheless, uh, what I have been, um, maybe stand this way, it's easier to see. So yeah, so, so the challenge, right, the challenge about how can we apply the quantum mechanical information is how can we really capture, right, that information related to strength and the low quality, okay? And the, uh, like I mentioned before, is I, I'm going to show you some examples, you know, I, when I study this, we can categorize, you know, how we can calculate all these electronic properties, right, but then is how can we, how can we apply for prediction? And there are people, as you know, for uh, crystal structure prediction, um, they actually apply, you know, they randomly generate maybe millions of crystal structures, right? And they run their energy, right? But again, it's, you know, this one million possibilities really represent a, a small portion right, of all possibilities. So there is, again, it's a, uh, it's a uh, uh, curse of dimensionality. So then, um, looking back, right, my method can be think about is how can we apply deep learning, right, and and cap and use the quantum information for uh, probability uh, probability prediction, right? And conventionally, uh, you know, we use so-called molecular descriptors and fingerprints to do prediction of QSAR couple uh, method. But one for traditional molecular uh, decryptors, for example, number of hundred bonding, donor acceptor, number of single bond, you know, rotational bond, those are empirical, right? And uh, they have very strong correlations, right? Strong correlations. Uh, another one people use a lot called fingerprints, right? You may heard about smiles, you know, those fingerprints. Those fing uh, fingerprints, just a string of symbols, right? They can actually capture a molecule very well, uh, not a confirmation though. Uh, but training, uh, learning, use deep learning, uh, your smiles is hard to train, right? Because that's, that smile string really represent, you can think about is, is uh, adjacency matrix, right? Of the bonding, which is very sparse, right? 90, probably 95% of the ad adjacency matrix are zeros, right? Only a few percent are ones, right? So that's why it's hard to train, right, to train those things. And the, for, you know, for, uh, for prediction with quantum information, uh, it's, it's kind of relatively new. Um, there are several different approaches. One is actually called a, a, a coolant matrix, right? It's again based on the um, uh, adjacency matrix, right? But you're gonna put a partial atomic charge, right, to each element. And also there are other type of, uh, again, other type of uh, uh, method is, again, still based on adjacency matrix right, of the molecule. Right? And uh, there are also other type of work is, is you're going to discrete size the space around the molecule. Right? And, and they use, say, uh, you know, maybe voxel or pixel to represent quantum information. Right? Uh, there are different, again, when you use molecular uh, adjacency based, uh, adjacency matrix based representation, you run into that sparse uh, sparsity of the training data. Right? If you use again, it's a coolant matrix, right? It only represent probably the nucleus, right? Atoms and bonding, right? Uh, it may not capture, right, uh, the information uh, for intermolecular interactions, right? Because intermolecular interactions for organic molecules are very weak. 
much weaker than covalent bond. Right? So if you use information for the bonding or nucleus, right, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard right, to categorize you know, the very subtle, uh, small difference among molecules. Um, so yeah, so when I started my uh, independent career, I actually used this method actually called the conceptual density function theory. Uh, you may have heard about it. So it's, it's a really a branch. Uh, it's different from a traditional Hartree-Fock method, right? So this method, they make assumption, right? Assumption is energy is functional of electron density, right? So that's really assumption. It's, it's mm -hmm. they don't base on any theory. So from there, again, you can see this molecular interaction and the, and the electronic interactions. Um, what I was really attractive to this method is really because connection between uh, conceptual that theory with this so-called HSAB principle. Right? And uh, you know, if you remember from the organic uh, uh, chemistry textbook, you know, this is really classical theory. Right? Any organic molecule can be categorized as either acid or base, right? and acid can be soft and hard. So I don't need to dwell uh, onto this equation. Um, so CFT, uh, uh, conceptual density theory, really proved the HICB principle, right? And uh, separate the energy between the uh, two molecules into different terms, right? There will be an electrostatic contribution and a covalent contribution and the polarization contribution, right? And they prove that for electrostatic potential is uh, is really determined by hardness, right? and the other two terms is determined by softness. And the, uh, from, the, from the theory, hardness is really the energy gap between the, between the HOMO and the LUMO, right? frontier orbitals. And frontier orbitals, uh, again, is, you know, if, if energy is small, right, then you know, molecule will be soft. Right? If energy gap is large, it's hard. And you can think about uh, softness as a polarizability. Right? So if electron density is kind of like a balloon, right? if you can squeeze it, right, it's more soft, right? more polarizable. Right? But if it's hard, right, the energy gap is higher, it's hard. Right? So basically, it's when you have a charged species, right? probably permanent charged species, they are very hard. Okay? So that's why interaction is determined by the uh, uh, hardness and softness. So what, one of our early work, actually, we're looking at the uh, different packing motifs right, of uh, uh, molecular interactions in uh, benzotic acid. Right? Very simple molecule, but there are like eight different uh, packing motifs. So what we did was, uh, let's say, it's hard to see. What we did was that a, uh, you can see there are eight different pairs. We actually can calculate different electronic properties, right, including actually one is called Fuqui function, which is really uh, represents local softness and uh, electrostatic potential. Right? And we integrate all these different uh, uh, electronic properties along the contact area. Right? And also we calculate intermodal interactions, the energy of each pair, and apply them. Right? We plot intermolecular interactions versus what's called the integrated right, electronic properties. And we do see a very linear uh, connections. Right? But in this case, definitely there's harder bonding. Right? So this, this, this trend is biased by the harder bonding interactions. So when we remove the harder bonding, we, again, we, we, we plot the correlation. Uh, we still see a very good correlation right, between these uh, 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 intermolecular interactions and the local electronic properties. And so one thing I need to point, uh, point out is uh, these two numbers, were, uh, and also this one, were calculated based on the electronic properties of single molecule, right? not from the already interacted pair. Right? So in this case, the so-called quantum information of a single molecule right, represents how this molecule can interact with other molecules. Maybe in this case, actually, with its own, right, another benzoic acid. So this really uh, motivated us to calculate the electronic property of a single molecule, right, and then predict how molecules interact with each other. Right? Um, 
So yeah, so this this is what we did. You know, again, so we have electron density, uh, electrostatic potential, and all these are Fukui functions. And the Fukui functions, you can think about the local part as a local polarizability, kind of softness. And so we were trying to use apply this to predict crystal structure. And as you may know, that current approach, I, I think, is really a brute force way to predict crystal structure. You generate you know, millions and run their energy. Right? What I'm trying to do is really based on the local property, right, try to generate possible, right, possible packing motifs. Right? The, again, the you know, reason for that is if we grow, for example, aspirin in a lab, we will get the same structure right, again and again. So in a way, molecule knows right, how to form crystal, right, that information. Um, yeah, so this, again, is this local electronic attributes harness of single molecule, right, capture that information. And the, uh, um, so yeah, well, when I try to apply that, uh, I run into this frustration, right, because again, it's this uh, uh, so-called curse of dimensionality, right, two molecule, if you, Put them together, right? There will be, you know, translational and rotational degree of freedoms. Right? Along each degree of freedom, if we only sample ten points, right? I, you know, ten points, because we have six degree of freedoms, you know, the combination will be one million, right? That actually is very rough, right? Imagine the angle, right? Three hundred sixty. If we only do ten, right? Ten. That's very rough sampling. We are running to one million. Right. So that's that's really, you know, the frustration we had uh, when we tried that approach. Um, so one of the good thing the COVID did to me actually, I was you know our lab was shut down, and uh, I was sitting in my basement and uh, and really got the time to do the coding to figure this out. We have this idea. So idea is really you know you you see this electronic information property on a molecular surface, right? Then can we project into a two-dimensional embedding? Right? And one of the top early this morning, I should mention the, uh, the embedding. Actually, I was was pleasant to see that. So there are different. Again, you can think about this as uh, really as a dimensionality reduction method, but there are also other type of approach. So what we tried is last one is called the uh, uh, is one of these stochastic neighborhood embedding. And uh, here are the equations. I, you know, people here really want to see equations. So here, so um, so the last function for this one is really a combination of two KL uh, divergence, right? And here's a parameter. It, it's really tried to again, it's, uh, on a surface, on a menu, on a molecular surface, we have the probability of J in the neighborhood of I, right? I and J are the surface vertices, right? Vertices. And the, so distance here actually is a, a geodesic distance on the surface. And this one is again on the 2D map, we also have a probability, but the distance is a, a Euclidean distance. Right? Then we do this uh, again optimization. Uh, idea is really to maintain right, the same numberhood right, on the two dimensional. And here is that a optimization process. Right? You, starting, uh, you start from a you know, randomly assign the positions of those uh, surface points, right? And then when we apply, you know, this optimization process, we will get a 2D embedding of the surface points. Right? And the, the color here, in this case, actually represents electrostatic potential, and uh, we can, again, the project the electronic properties on this 2D embedding. Right? Uh, however, as we all know, when we do this uh, 2D embedding, right? There will be information loss. Right? There will be false positive, false negative, and uh, so um, you know. The, right now, this is actually the uh, here. Just gave you an example. Here actually is a map uh, we use in US. Right? In US, and here's a map. You know, when I grew up in China, here we use a map, right? And uh, so when I was a little kid. I, I I just didn't know why China is called in the Far East. Right, far east, right? We also think China is middle kingdom, right? It's, it's, it's middle right here, right? But you can, if you see this map, right? China is, is again, the far east, right? 
So that's against information laws when you, you know, try to project the globe on a 2D. Okay. Um, so nonetheless, you know, here really show there's a way you know, to do that is just by cutting, right, surface cutting. So that's that's what we did. Is actually we can you know artificially introduce a cutting a cutting along that uh, uh, surface uh, 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 marker surface and do that process. So one on the left is is I call enclosed a manifold, and the one on the right is cut it right cut manifold. Right? And and this this will be the uh, optimization process. And definitely. You know, here it seems like there's opening right here. It's really because it's cut line, right? and the algorithm is is trying to figure out how to really open up, right, along that cut line. Okay? And the uh, so right now is this one on the left is already finished, but the one on the right, you know, is still kind of struggling a little bit, but eventually it actually opened up, right? opened up. Um, so the one on the right, right, actually has no false information. Right? Only false information is this is manually introduced a line. Right? That's false information. But other than that, you know, algorithm algorithm itself didn't generate any false information. False information. So yeah, so you can see on the right, the uh, the manifold is finally uh, opened up. Um, okay, I just move on. Right? So here. I actually show, you know, again, when we have the 2D map, we actually can, you know, translate the electronic properties on that map, right? So now we have a 2D representation of the map, right? Nice thing about this representation is we will not have any uh, um, dimensionality related to translation and orientation, right? Because for different translation or orientation of the molecule, we will have the same representation. Same representation, and the, so this one actually is tofinamic acid, uh, two different conformation, and you can see they actually have you know slightly different uh, representation. And here I actually show um, the two on the on the left are the uh, closed uh, manifold, and two on the right are the uh, uh, cut uh, manifold. Right? So since the the two on the right contain more information, uh, contain more information. Um, so yeah, so this one again is, uh, uh, you know, just gave you a quick overview of recent activity uh, solubility prediction uh, use this information. Um, to be honest, actually, uh, I was uh, I was really suspicious about deep learning um, you know, when I try it. You know, I, personally, I saw that would be just one of the statistical you know, nonlinear regression method. But this turned out is much powerful, you know. After I tried, so now I actually, personally, I completely sold on the idea of deep learning, and uh, so that's uh, you know right now it's our major uh, research uh, direction. And the uh, so to in order to use those again the two D two D uh, two dimensional mapping for deep learning, what we need to do is really to extract the features right, and the uh, to generate a matrix format for deep learning. So what you can see, actually, one of the methods we use uh, is called a shape context, right? So this is a, 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 the uh, 2D map. For key points, uh, we, we use a series of bins, right? Radial bins and angular bins, right? To uh, capture uh, this neighborhood uh, information, as you can see here. And they use this matrix form for deep learning. And the, uh, so this one is, again, this one is we use a 16 radial bin and a four angular, right? So total is about a 64, right? And the key points are defined as a surface uh, point that close to each atom, right, in 3D, right? Because 3D, we have atom that closes the surface point, right? we, we think as key points. So although this three-dimensional information, you can see there are thousands of vertices, right? and even use 2D map, you know, if we use you know, convolutional neural network, the dimensionality of a map itself is very high. Right? It could be hundreds of thousands or even millions. Right? But if we do this shape context, we have really kind of low uh, dim dimensional representation of the electron properties. 
So that's what we use, and here is a uh, neural network. Uh, we actually use so-called uh, called the deep sets, right? Deep sets architecture. It's really use a mechanism mechanism called self attention, right? self attention. Try to capture the information embedded in that uh, matrix form. And the, uh, so this one, we actually we did a comparison. We actually get about 133 molecules from the two solubility challenges. And we calculate that. We actually uh, do the uh, comparison of their similarity. But the similarity, the difference, has nothing to do with solubility. Right here, that's just solubility. So basically, if we just look at a difference, it may not capture the information on solubility. But when we use these maps to do solubility prediction, you can see right here. Right? We, since we only have 133 molecules, we need a 256 cross-validation right, of the molecules. Split the data as 9 to 10, uh, sorry, 9 to 1. Right? And you can see the prediction actually is, is, uh, is, is actually very, very good. And here are the molecules within half log unit, right? This larger than one log unit. What I'm pointing out is RMSC, the green lines of the prediction of each molecule, is related how the data distributed, right? For these two molecules, we don't have any training data, right? That's why it was not predicted well, right? So this really highlights a feature of deep learning is, is the quality of prediction is also determined by the quality of data. Uh, let me okay yeah so again we we improved that and the uh, and the another thing we did the uh, drug induced uh, liver toxicity so one minute I summarize that so for liver toxicity we get have one that's actually greater than 0.9 right? and we have about 500 molecules so I was actually at this point I'm fully convinced the power of deep learning right for drug induced liver toxicity is really complicated process. So why this molecule really can capture those information and you know predict liver toxicity, right? and the, uh, so I you know I'm pleased with the results, but I'm also intrigued by the call you know by the by the power of the prediction. Right? So we are again trying different math you know different properties, and the um, you know I'll probably talk to Leslie about uh, the oral bioavailability, and we'll try that. As well, and uh, so with that, um, thank you again for the invitation, and more than happy to answer any questions you have. Any question? Thank you very much. Any question to Dr. Lee, please. Panos. Uh, very nice. I like this very much. No, no. Yeah. I'm sorry. We were in the artillery. We don't do Okay, so I like very much this work, since uh, apart from solubility, this should be very interesting for dissolution. Since uh, 1897, when we had the first experiment in uh, dissolution, noise weakening, yeah. there were two theories developed, the diffusion layer model and the reaction limited model. Since uh, the, reaction, the diffusion layer model is a simple, safe, first order differential equation, this is the prevailing way of thinking since then, more than one century. But there are many, many indications that the fusion layer model is not the true model of working. In fact, I have published a work using uh, classical, say, experiments, and I proved clearly with a Fisher information matrix that this is not working under in vitro conditions. Recently, there are some papers which indicate that the reaction limited uh, case is the working hypothesis for class two drugs, while for class one drugs in the diffusion layer model. Michael Weiss has done some work in the past in this area. So I think your same approaches with the molecular forces and the interaction with the solvent can make a very nice insight in the actual mechanism of dissolution processes depending on the hydrophobicity of the, of the molecule on the molecular surface. So I think that you can move towards this uh, it's a real dilemma. What is actually taking place, either in vitro or in vivo? Well, 
uh, a certain thanks uh, for the question. Uh, I probably don't have the answer for that, but uh, you know, the, the thinking about the deep learning is you know based on the data, right? How you use data to do prediction, and the most I talk today is data, model, and a parameter. Right? So that I think that's a difference between you know model based versus data driven uh, approaches. Yeah. And fundamentally, I think they share you know, very similarities. And uh, by doing this, actually, I'm, right now, actually, I didn't have time to show, actually, there's a way to use Gaussian process right, to capture the quantum information. Right? So this information right now is we cannot go back. Right? But if we apply other type of maybe Bayesian-based and Gaussian process, we actually can capture a kernel of that quantum information and, uh, and predict and go back to predict uh, structures. So that may relate it to uh, de novo design of, of molecules. Tony, what database are you using for your DILI? This one is FDA's DILI. The 254 drugs, the uh, FDA 254 drugs. I think it's over a thousand now. Oh, I saw that now. Yeah. Okay, so I, I send you. Some okay, data. yeah. But I'm looking forward to your yeah. bioavailability data. You know, no, so. <laughs> I have also daily data. Yeah, daily data. Yeah. And also, we actually tried, there's one data set called, you know, from the PubCam about the uh, SIP, P450. So we also do, uh, did a prediction for that one. There was about uh, uh, 14,000 molecules. And uh, so for 182, uh, we can achieve that one score about 0.8. But it's interesting for other ISO forms, like 2D6, the prediction was poor, right? So at this point, I'm, I'm puzzled, right? I'm puzzled. Why for different ISO forms, we have different performance? Um, yeah. Okay, there is a 900 database of DPCS, say, yeah, plus, okay, <laughs> we, we, we talk to him about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so is Tycho ready to present? Go ahead. Okay, we'll yeah. What about the, where are the Zoom people, uh, Panos? They are actually going to present. So Tycho Highlight from Merck will be the next speaker by Zoom. Is he here? Tycho, are you there? Can you see me? Oh, hi, Tycho. Okay. You. So he will. Oh, what did I do? So there they are. Okay. So our next and second talk will be physiologic based biopharmaceutic modeling to inform formulation selection and define bioequivalent safe space. So, Tycho, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Can you can you confirm that I can be heard? We can hear you. Yes. Very well, then I will share the screen. Give me one second. And you can see the screen now. Yes, but make it full scale. And I'm going to go into the full screen mode. Okay. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers, panels, and others uh, for allowing me to speak about PBBM, physiologic based biopharmaceutics modeling, uh, focusing on formulation selection and to define the bioequivalence safe space. Uh, sometimes we call it also dissolution safe space. And if you're looking uh, at this slide here, this is really about the business case or the opportunity statement. The field of PBBM has seen significant growth over the past five years, as you can see in the graph below from uh, Omanand and uh, FDA authors. Actually, in 2021, there were already 50 publications uh, on PBBM. Uh, we did the analysis, it's now 75 papers for 2022, and we're well on track to exceed this number for 2023. When you're seeing the term PBBM, uh, you typically see terms such as dissolution specification and bridging of formulations. Now I will um, basically cover a little bit about the background and the history of PBBM, and then I will have um, two case studies 
The case studies should be of relevance to anyone who is working either in clinical pharmacology space or uh, PK scaling or in the formulation developments. And uh, this slide you can see here, this is a slide where we're talking about uh, PBBM, which is a subset of uh, PBPK. You see two ovals here. This uh, slide took quite a while to align with, uh, with others in the scientific field. You can see the bigger, the bigger oval, which is the PBPK, and it in, it's a, a large envelope uh, which covers, for example, pharmacokinetic modeling in specific populations, renal and hepatic impairment. I've worked in that space. I've also worked in the pediatrics space. And uh, the PBPK also includes things in clinical pharmacology such as full defect predictions and uh, bioequivalent, bioequivalence assessment. Uh, but uh, what we're talking about here is PBBM is focusing on drug product quality attributes and applications. Both uh, can be used by innovator companies and also generics. So if you're thinking about uh, tablet or capsule for small molecules and you think about drug product quality, you can think of PBBM. Typically included is dissolution data modeling, which uh, most PBPK scientists are not really that familiar with. And I will be speaking to you about uh, how the PBBM can be used for dissolution, safe space establishment, and the formulation selection, as well as overriding dissimilarities in formulations and uh, identifying rate limits to absorption. And uh, right up front, I would like to point to you, there is a 2023 global PBBM workshop. Uh, it's the, the University of Maryland. This workshop is actively under planning. The key here is that we will have seven regulatory agencies uh, present, and they will be speaking about what is their expectations and their findings from several case studies that the industry has submitted. Uh, so you will see representations from FDA, EMA, Health Canada, uh, Anvisa, MHRA, and PMDA. So anyone who is not familiar with PBBM for regulatory applications uh, uh, can certainly attend this particular uh, workshop. And looking at some of the uh, our more recent publications, uh, we had one here with my uh, colleague uh, Dr. D. Wu, and uh, together working with a generic industry from uh, Dr. Reddy's lab and also from Zytus Life Sciences. We had to publish some case studies so where we defined in the bioequivalent safe space using uh, PBBM and looking at critical bioavailability attributes. Additional case studies can be found in this particular manuscript 2021, looking at case studies uh, from uh, mainly a GastroPlus user community, but also um, innovator companies, academia, and uh, generic companies. Just uh, to see how PBBM applications can be used in drug development, I'd like to point out that within Merck and other big uh, pharma companies, uh, PBBM is being used to identify whether or not, for example, a uh, enabled formulation is needed or conventional formulations can be used. It is also used to identify the pH-dependent drug absorption and also looking at the various various impacts such as modified release formulations are they needed uh, for the for the clinical studies but today i'm going to be focusing more on the setting up the, the bioequivalent safe space the widening of the uh, dissolution specifications and also looking at the impact of changes of dissolution on the bioequivalent uh, for for an intended commercial product Again, the interested reader can look at the additional case studies in this and in other publications. Here, uh, for those of you who are not so involved with the dissolution data modeling, uh, we, are, we are saying that the PBBM bioequivalent safe space, this is an example of where the uh, PBBM model can override F2 non-similarity. So what we're showing here is we're showing a test formulation, a reference formulation, F2 is less than 50, indicating non-similarity. Non -similarity. However, 
um, and this is often done when when we have to follow the regulatory QC methods. Uh, we see this disconnect, but then when we test it in the clinic, we find out that indeed the, the, the two formulations were bioequivalent. And uh, the, the question is, why does this occur? This indicates that this dissolution method is over-discriminating. And sometimes together with PDBM modeling, you can identify that these two profiles, even though they in, indicate non-similarity in vitro, they will lead to in vivo bioequivalence in, because the permeability, for example, can be rate limiting. And here is a uh, sort of high level slide. I, I, I saw there was previous presentations on PDPK, but I just wanted to highlight here uh, from this work from uh, Dr. Fang Wu and other authors at FDA that uh, we are focusing on drug dependent parameters, formulation dependent parameters, and physiological parameters. The drug dependent parameters, uh, the, the ones that are of relevance here, these are all called critical bioavailability attributes, and then we can see the abbreviations here. We have critical process parameters such as compression force, uh, the critical quality attributes, and this is the dissolution data. And then we have also critical material attributes that includes particle size distribution. When you're in the formulation side, this is uh, very important. And uh, formulators need to worry about having predictable pharmacokinetics, linear pharmacokinetics, and predictable outcomes in the clinic. So that's why uh, there's a lot of emphasis spent there, and we're looking at, again, these drug-dependent parameters as input into a, uh, a gastroplast or simsim or other physiologically-based models. And then once you have the systemic pharmacokinetics, uh, ideally from an intravenous arm, you can refine the model. Typically, this is done with um, multiple clinical data sets, and then you can use the model for its intended purposes, looking at how does this solution impact pharmacokinetics. I just wanted to, to remind you that, again, from uh, PBBM inputs, we are interested in PH solubility profiles, dissolution profiles, particle size distribution. We are also typically looking at various doses from uh, uh, capsules or tablets or modified release formulations. And in some cases, we may also evaluate the impact of the gastric pH, particularly for weak bases. Now, uh, why would you use PBBM, and what's the purpose? Right, uh, we are we are we are using PBBM uh, because we think it's value added because it has the capability to integrate drug product physical chemical properties along with the dissolution profiles to predict in vivo PK uh, PK performance. And for, in order for this to work, of course, um, appropriate due diligence has to be spent on the input of the drug product quality attributes, uh, such that the model can be used for the biopharmaceutics assessment. The PBBM, and this is important, the parameter sensitivity analysis becomes very important because it allows us to, for example, identify what is what is rate controlling absorption? Uh, is this uh, is this permeability? Is it solubility dissolution? Uh, is it gastric pH or is it uh, things such as uh, gastric emptying? And once you have a model, then you can uh, use the PBBM to help with uh, dissolution specification setting, for example. And I know this is a busy slide it's again in our publication, but uh, if you have heard previous presentations on PBPK, the, the, the steps are similar. There's a model setup, a model validation, a model application. But when you're dealing with PBPM, a lot of data, a lot of emphasis is on dissolution data, where we're looking at various ways to model dissolution data. And uh, uh, again, the, uh, the interested reader can look at these publications. Uh, are we talking about some examples of where we're using a viable function? Uh, this is uh, a, a very powerful method because you can uh, describe very complex dissolution profiles. And in other cases, another commonly used method that uh, is used in industry very often is the Z factor, also, also known as Takano model, uh, which is a hybrid, uh, a hybrid uh, factor. And here we have uh, just another recent publication from uh, Sivacha and Koli Parama, my former colleague. And uh, he and his team are just basically describing different methods of modeling dissolution data. So this is the observed data in the squares and then fitting 
the dissolution data to a, a model. Now, why do you need to model dissolution data? Well, you need to model the dissolution data if you want to conduct, uh, for example, parameter sensitivity analysis. And here, the model that's the uh, Sarcano, uh, the, the Takano Z factor model, which is again hybrid parameter, hybrid parameter, which includes the uh, diffusion, diffusion co coefficient, the aqueous boundary layer, particle size distribution, and uh, the uh, density of the drug. And uh, what we can see is that the fit of in this particular case is uh, pretty good, and it should this should be by the way independent of pH. If you are interested in learning more about how dissolution data is modeled, you can again read this publication. Direct input is actually relatively rare. And here we can see this 2020 uh, draft guidance from the FDA, where uh, the we, in the industry we're calling this the PBBM guidance, but uh, here it's called physiologically based pharmacokinetic analysis for uh, biopharmaceutics application for all drug product development. It's a very long title, but those of you who are interested in the details, I highly recommend for you to not just look at the guidance, but there is um, there's a comment section available, readily available, where you can see the input from the IQ consortium and many individual companies uh, on their thinking of this current draft guidance. And uh, one of the uh, one of the remarkable things about the PBBM draft guidance is uh, that it talks about to increase the mo uh, the confidence in the model. We strongly recommend the sponsors demonstrate the model's predictive performance for batches exhibiting unacceptable bioavailability. Okay, and and this uh, sounds easy, but it's actually not that easy because it would require you to make a non-bio equivalent batch. And uh, this is sometimes not possible within the given process parameter, particularly for uh, well-behaved drugs. And the same draft guidance is very useful because in the, in the appendix it has a number of definitions, uh, one of them being that the, the, what is the safe space, this, the boundaries defined by the in vitro specifications, such as dissolution could be tablet hardness, uh, where for which product variants are anticipated to be bioequivalent to one another. And uh, this uh, slide also from Sandra Suarez highlights this point where we have uh, not just we have a targeted profile, this could be your uh, pivoted, your pivotal batch, uh, your bio batch as it's called in formulation sciences, and then you have uh, typically a bioequivalent space that you can uh, calculate based on uh, based on uh, F2 criteria, but here we will have to have clinical data for it. And then ideally you have a knowledge space outside of the bioequivalents, uh, such that you better understand the, your drug uh, product and you have pushed the, the knowledge envelope. And in our uh, publication, we also uh, highlighted this with additional, this uh, figure here where we're looking at the innovator drugs versus generic drugs. Typically, uh, what you're looking at is the uh, pivotal, the pivotal phase three lot that's your sort of your target, and then you're trying to make sure that you are bioequivalent to this particular pivotal batch, or when you have generics, uh, you're, you're trying to be bioequivalent to the reference listed drug, and you have this bioequivalent space. Again, uh, the desire is to have non-bioequivalent lots, and um, as I mentioned, this could be uh, uh, difficult to achieve with uh, practicality for some drugs. This now brings me to one of the uh, case studies, which here is uh, Rebosiclip that uh, uh, we published uh, with our legacy colleagues from Novartis, where uh, Rebosiclip is a base, uh, BCS class 3 drug, and the purpose was to identify uh, to, de to demonstrate there's bioequivalence between capsules versus tablets. Capsules were developed first, and then uh, the tablets, uh, because at that time the repository was on fast track approval, we had to make sure there's bioequivalence between the tablets and the capsules, and then also help in the dissolution specification settings. Uh, again, once you're dealing with PBBM, you will always see the same layout. You will typically find an IR formulation. 
you will find the dissolution message, which is the QC message. Uh, here is the PH2 in the United States Pharmacopeia 2 message um, with 50 RPMs. And then the dissolution models that were used as effect on the viral function. And what you can see here is just a little bit more of the history. The capsule formulation was used in the early and late development, but the tablet was the one that was to be marketed and, and is marketed. Um, and uh, it's a BCSV compound, repository is a BCSV compound with moderate permeability, but it is not very rapidly dissolving. The uh, F2 similarity uh, failed in all four quality control media. These are the typically used media, pH 1, 2, 4.5, and 6.8, indicating non-similarity between the capsule and the tablet. However, the bioequivalence uh, study showed perfect bioequivalence, something that we had anticipated. And as you will see, PBBM shows that perme permeability is weight controlling absorption and it is not solubility dissolution. When you look at the publication, you will see uh, the model described in detail, including the justification for all the input parameters that go into the, into the um, in this case, gas plus model. And what we have here is we have a moderate uh, KQ2 permeability uh, with 1.8 times 10 to minus 6, and also calculated from that the moderate human effective permeability. And this uh, figure you can also find it in the publication. It's always uh, the same flow where you have model development, model validation, and model use. The uh, model development includes the justification of physical chemical properties, a pH solubility profile, and of course permeability inputs. And then uh, the choice of the dissolution data and the modeling of the dissolution data. Now here in the middle is where clinical pharmacology comes in and uh, we have uh, three different pharmacokinetic studies with the pharmacokinetics in the capsule in patients. This is the first human study. We have pharmacokinetics of capsule and tablets in healthy volunteers. And then we have yet another study looking at pharmacokinetics of tapsule, capsule and tablets in patients. So three different independent studies were used in the model uh, validation such that ultimately you can use the model uh, for the setting of the bioequivalent safe space and the, the dissolution specification. And of course, what we're doing is in drug development, we're evaluating the impact of virtual batches on bioequivalence. And uh, this is a slide which uh, I, I think anybody who does not usually deal with dissolution data modeling should uh, sort of visually capture. Uh, if you're in, in, in clinical pharmacology, you should at least know what a what an F2 factor is. And what we are showing here is this is the pH 1, 2, 4.5, 6.8. And we can see that these dissolution profiles are not similar because F2 is in all cases less than 50. So this would indicate bio non-equivalence. However, uh, as I had explained, uh, what we can see is we, we can calculate the in vivo dissolution and we can see the tablet is consistently slower than the capsule. Uh, this is not uh, surprising that this is calculated like this. However, it does not matter because in vivo absorption is uh, very similar and partially superimposable, leading to bioequivalence. The reason is because, again, permeation is weight controlling the absorption. It is not the solubility or dissolution from the QC media. And uh, here is the, on the right, we have the clinical data for the uh, commercial batches of the capsule. Uh, I'm sorry, the commercial batch from the tablet versus the capsule. You can see these profiles are basically superimposable. Um, bioequivalence is perfectly met. And when we uh, conduct the modeling, we can uh, capture the variability. Uh, this is the uh, this is the, the mean, uh, uh, this is the confidence around the mean, along with the various probability plots. This is for 600 milligram uh, tablet. Uh, this drug is also known as uh, Kiskali in the US. And again, uh, we are now using various dissolution models. In this case, we use the vivo function. And uh, when we use the vivo function, we can then basically uh, 
create a uh, simulated safe space that goes beyond the clin clinically known space. So the green space is, uh, we can see here, is the film coated tablets, a bioequivalent batch, and the commercial blanch. This is what these two were tested in the clinic. And you can then use the virtual Belize profile to figure out where is the edge of the failure of the, of the bioequivalents. And what we can see here is that we had a um, specification at 45 minutes and 80% is at the edge of the failure. You can then run, of course, various uh, virtual batches against the uh, targeted batch, and you can look here at the uh, Rebosigib tablet, the BE batch, that's the, 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 the bio batch, versus various virtual batches, and you can see that these are bioequivalent. Now, most importantly, you can use uh, PBBM to identify what's rate controlling, um, uh, rate controlling CMAX. CMAX is usually the parameter which falls out of specification more easily uh, for bioequivalence assessment. And what we can see is that uh, permeability has a big impact on CMAX, as does a small intestinal transit time. But we can also see that based on the solubility and the dose that we have, uh, stomach pH, for example, does not have a significant impact on, on CMAX and neither do some of the other parameters uh, such as precipitation time. This figure is also uh, included in the publication in the supplemental section. And then the, uh, uh, the same gastroplastic SIMSIP can also be used to look at additional clinical pharmacology questions uh, such as what happens when the stomach pH changes we can see that fraction absorbed is calculated to be un, uh, high and unaltered by um, the stomach pH. So in summary for the ribosiclip, uh, systemic exposure is permeation rate controlled and uh, the widening of the safe space was achieved by using PBBM models. We can also see that in this case the quality control method that's typically required by, by health authorities is over discriminating and does not uh, constitute biopredictiveness. We also, of course, identified various critical parameters such as uh, permeability and gastric emptying time as, uh, in, as controlling CMAX. Now, here we come a, uh, to a, yet uh, a newer example published uh, f this February. Uh, by uh, my friend. Sir, Monica. it's half an hour. You got your 30 minutes, and you know it's very late. We are in Greece. You know, it's, so well, I, so well, you should finish, and then you can take a question, and we have to move on. Sorry. Uh, well, I didn't start at 12. Okay, my time is exactly 30 minutes. But okay, you got you got already your eight minutes beyond the 7:30. Okay, um, I'll make this short. Um, QAW039 was a VCS4 drug published by uh, my former colleagues um, uh, at Novartis and myself. And it's a sweet ionic compound. Uh, what you will see is when you read the publication, it has bioequivalence and has non bioequivalent data. We have uh, basically a simple workflow, we have intravenous data. Uh, with microdosing, I think that was explained earlier in your conference, and we have two different doses, and we set up the model uh, using all the intravenous data and using various clinical data. And then what we're basically doing is uh, we are setting up uh, virtual bioequivalence trials to set the specification. So here, uh, what we can see is uh, we have 450 milligrams. We have a fast release formulation and the slow release formulation, we can see that the percent in vivo is higher for the faster release and slower uh, and incomplete for slower release formulation. And this translates, as you can see here, into different CMAX concentrations. So this is a bio non-equivalent formulation. This is bio equivalent. And coming here to the green space, and this is my last slide, we can see that we have the pink curve, which is the 450 milligrams bio non-equivalent. And then we have the blue curve, which is in the green space and is bioequivalent. 
and then the final the, the final marketed formulation was very well within the green space and the specifications were set at one hour and 80 uh, percent so with this uh, we can basically uh, complete here uh, when we have various uh, PBBM models to assess the bioequivalence for formulation and define the safe space. And again, I would like to point you to this uh, workshop that's coming up, and with this, I thank you. Thank you, Taiko. Thank you, Taiko. Any questions? I, I would just say one thing, Taiko. Your, your first example for a 600 milligram tablet with the solubility data that you showed, I don't see why that's a class three drug. I do believe this, is, you know, dissolution is the thing, but your your that was certainly a class four drug in terms of the solubility for measures you gave us. Yes, and it's a, it's a yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, it's a valid point. Actually, the uh, it, there was going back and forth between how how the mathematically it is a mathematically it is uh, for sure a bcs4 one um, th that is true and you, it, you're correct here on this solubility the dose number will be less than one right yeah but it's still very nice work so thank you very much other questions for Tycho? okay thank you very much Tycho, for the presentation and i will see you in a month when i come to america <laughs> A uh, next presentation, Panos. We have another virtual. Yeah, uh, okay, so who's the who's the lecturer? So the last but not least presentation is given by a group from uh, Tirana, Albania, and I think it's who are this, the, the speaker is Dr. Gochi, yeah. Van der Heiden, and uh, Saskia Develt and. Uh, the presentation is entitled a physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling for clinical drug dosing in pediatric uh, pediatrics carbamazepine sip sip simulation. Please, 15 minutes. Hello. Yeah, okay. I'll be in time. Hello, everybody. Hello from Albania. It's very nice to be here with you. This presentation and uh, This study is according to a cost uh, action project. I have been part of one uh, scientific uh, missions, short-term scientific missions by cost uh, UNGAP cost project, and I have been there at Red Boat VMC Nine Again Netherlands for eight weeks, and that we have done this PKPB uh, models to pediatric in carbamazepine sim -sim simulations. So as the number of in vivo studies for children is limited, the study is uh, try to evaluate the PBPK model to mi minimize the pharmacological difference between pediatric population and adults. And also the use of virtual machines will have to eliminate the obstacles of stabilization of the dosing regime to uh, children treating them as small adults. So, the aim of this study is to provide a physical-based PBPK model informed dosing recommendations and uh, in children for drugs with less to non pk data. First, we need to evaluate if it is feasible to pragmatically simulate a drug with abundant PK data, such as carbamazepine, then, the, therefore, the aim of this work was to evaluate if the carbamazepine PK in children can be captured by the model. So, the carbamazepine is the drug that we have simulated, and the carbamazepine by SIMSIP, and we know we have to, first of all, to study the characteristics, drug characterizations of the carbamazepine. So, as we may see, by the literature that the best anticonvulsant seems to be obtained the plasma concentrations um, 15 to 40 micromole per milliliter and a similar optimal uh, plasma concentration range was found in a control study in trichomania 
uh, neuralgia. So as we have seen by characterization of the PK data of carbamazepine, bioavailability is according to 90% peak plasma concentration is arrived from one uh, half to 28 hours. Volume of distributions goes to 0.7 to 2 liter per kilogram and so on. This is also a drug with uh, bind protein binding high protein binding and uh, half-life uh, half from uh, 25 to 65 hours for the uh, started and then to the uh, to the other from the chronics uh, chronics uses four to 70 uh, 70 hours the the best anti is also uh, by uh, and so uh, reference this is by other authors, it is seen that we have also the, uh, the target trough level from uh, 4 to 12 milligrams per milliliters. And we see that uh, uh, hepatic metabolism is arrived by uh, CIP450 uh, uh, on the main metabolite, metabolite is carbamazepine epoxy. So, uh, PPPK models are compartmental mathematical models that uh, can be used to predict plasma concentration in pediatric population and to cure insight into the influence of age dependent physiological difference by their disposition. The simpson based uh, population's a ADME simulators is a platform and database for mechanistic modeling, modeling and simulation of the process of viral oral observation, tissue distribution, metabolism, excretion of drugs, and drug candidates in healthy and busy populations. So from our study, we have followed this workflow. First of all, we have done a search by the, uh, as a literacy for adult PK data. We have uh, simulated adult PB PK models and evaluated these data. And then we just uh, simulated pediatric PB, PB models and evaluated them. And we have done visual predictive check, predictive check and uh, uh, seen by the 0 0.2 to twofold PKE ratio acceptance rate. And this is the, all the observed and uh, predicted data. It is evaluated the ratios that has to be between the interval of confidence. Uh, the data was evaluated by authors. We have uh, researched and checked uh, the data by ad adult single doses. And there we presented some of the authors that we have um, done simulations. For adult single doses, we have checked Barzaki et al., Pinanen, and for uh, adult multi doses also, we have examples here for Chan et al. and Ger Gerardini et al., and three authors for pediatric multi doses. We have to know that the, uh, the studies that have done to the adults are done to the healthy uh, populations, but to the pediatric are done at the um, patients that, I, uh, that have the DC uh, that use for carbamazepines. So by Pinon and Natal, we have seen that they have used 400 milligrams single dose of carbamazepine to healthy males from 21 to 22 years. By the simulation that the SIMSIM platform, we have mm -hmm. seen, uh, we have these graphs, and we may see that the uh, yellow points, um, yellow dots are from the uh, in vitro uh, clinical data by the Pinon and the other authors, and the Graphs simulated by uh, the platform are the, the green one, and the interval of the confidence are the, uh, the gray lines. So, if we may see by the, the we may see by the table the picky data that are well evaluated and predicted are the clearance, the Cmax value, Tmax volume of distribution, LC, and T house. And we, by visual check, we may see, and also by the ratio, we can see that the ratio that is inside the values of the acceptance range are the Cmax, Tmax, and the volume of distributions. The other that's good out are the cle uh, clearance and the AOC and the T-half values. So by the adult single doses, we may see that in the general that the clearance is overpredicted in adult single doses by SIMSIP, while AOC values and T-half are underpredicted. 
by the adult multi-dose by the authors of Chandatal, they have used in clinical data 200 milligrams twice daily for uh, patients that, uh, that are healthy men, also healthy volunteers. They use that for 30 days. The range of the age is 33 to 47. And the graph, by the graph, we may see that the uh, yellow uh, dots that goes well by the clinical data also fits good with the uh, green and the graphs on the linear plots that they are uh, predicted by the SIMSIP. And the value by uh, uh, evaluated by SIMSIP and also observed goes well PT data, CMAX, TMAX, and LC and the half. They are, be they are between the acceptance range and the ratios. So we can conclude it that overall plasma concentrations are more accurately predicted after multiply doses compared to single dose simulations. This can be a result of uh, the cytochrome 3A4-5 autoinduction, all predicted to observe PK parameters for multiplied doses studies fall within the acceptance range, and the model is considered fit for purpose for multiplied dose simulations. Okay. So we may see in the other slide that sorry for not using moving the slides. We have seen by the other slide, this slide that uh, is the auto-induction of this, this enzyme, CYP3A4, and uh, more than 80% of this enzyme is auto-induction by cabamazepine at these patients. By the other slide, we may see that the auto-induction is done by this enzyme for cabamazepine to the auto-induction. In pediatric multiplied doses, Kaisonetan, it is used 7.35 milligrams twice daily to pediatric patients with epilepsy from uh, two years old to 21. And we may see that the yellow dots uh, get it by uh, clinical data of uh, the, these authors goes well and fits with the graphs, linear, uh, the graphs predicted by SIMSIP. So the green line is uh, goes then fits well with the uh, yellow dots and the PK data is evaluated and observed are uh, clean lines, volume of distribution and T house and the values of them, the ratio of uh, predicted and observed values goes between the acceptance range. We have also uh, simulated the data from Egg Olufsen et al. They have given 200 milligrams twice daily oral dose of cabamazepine to uh, patients at the range for um, with epilepsy, pediatric one, from four years to 13 years. And as we may see by the plot, it glues very well. The yellow dots get by the clinical data to the plot by or the graph by the uh, the same set with a green line. But the problem with these authors is that we can't evaluate the PK and the, we can't make the ratio between the observed and predicted uh, PK data because they have the problem with the calculations of the value. By the other authors, the Sacker et al., they have used 200 milligrams four times daily oral dose to pediatrics with epilepsy also for the range of age from 8 to 17 years and also this typical graph of multiply dose regimes. We may see the yellow dots that goes uh, from the clinical data goes well with the graphs and also we have evaluated two picky uh, parameters. CMAX and AOC, and this also these values goes between the uh, acceptance range of observed, predicted to observed data. So, by pediatric multiplied doses, as well as, well as with uh, the adult multiplied doses simulations, prediction in children upon pediatric multiplied doses and simulations are accurate. The elimination of carbamazepine with the auto induction of CIP. 3A, 4, 5 are well captured by the model. 
As a discussion, the major metabolizing enzyme from carbamazepine is CYP. 3A4, which activity increases with twofold due to auto inductions in multiplied doses in chronic disease. Fluence is more accurately predicted in multiplied dose simulations compared to single dose simulations. Moreover, pediatric predictions are very accurate, including the clearance. Another PK of carbamazepine PBPK model is evaluated in Gastroplast by Goldman et al. Uh, which is uh, able to create a dull single dose prediction. By our uh, simulations, we can't predict a dull single dose, but also only uh, multiply doses. As conclusion, pediatric exposure is accurately predicted. Thus, the pediatric uh, multiply carbamazepine exposure can be simulated by SimSIP. When the simulation results are combined with the pharmacodynamics of carbamazepine, model informed dosing recommendations may be established. So, at the last, I want to make a special thanks to the team of Red Bull EMC, University Medical Center Nijmegen, the my host professor, Pro. Professor Saskia de Wilt, and also the other collaborators, Joyce, Jolien, Marika, and Dal. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Koshi. Any question? Uh, Carol, please. Is this practical for use in the clinic? Did you hear the question? The question no. was Is this practical to use in the clinics? Yeah, it's practical to you. Is, practical it, to use. is it practical to use in the clinics? These simulations. Yes. They, these are trying to make more practical to use in clinics because this professor Saskia is a pediatrician and th she thinks that they have to make more simulations and to make those regimes only for children and so not to consider them that uh, small adults. Uh, one comment I have to I can head. Uh, this is Mayor Bialian. Uh, you know, in adult and also in adolescents, we mainly use control release carbamazepine because mm -hmm. studies have shown that none of the new antiepileptic drugs can beat carbamazepine control release. And there is this one study that lamotrigine was superior in terms of efficacy to immediate release carbamazepine but when somebody has repeated the control release. So my suggestion to you, when you run the simulation, even pediatric or the papers you, 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 you quoted by like Olafsson and, and, and Tucker and others, try to differentiate between immediate release and control release because at the end of the day, patients with epilepsy will benefit much more with control release carbamazepine with the, than the immediate release. Any comments, please? We didn't find any, <laughs> any clinical data for the, these modified release tablets or only from um, and on, on, on conversion, conversions one, but uh, we have we have also to said that the, that is more uh, useful to and more data are accuracy by multiplied doses on chronic regime. This is go by and the PK data are more available by chronic regimes because the auto inductions of the cytokines and when you go the doses at the standby. Uh, levels. Yeah, but auto, uh, auto infection uh, is over after one month or so. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. three to five weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Okay. And they stabilize that. And the seems if that's predictable. So. Okay, thank you very much and good luck with your studies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you all have a, a good afternoon and gala dinner. Wonderful <laughs> one. <laughs> okay, this concludes the session. We did pretty well in terms of time. The banquet starts in half an hour. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 35 minutes. Thank you.